Bom dia a todos. Vamos dar início a esse evento. Depois farei toda uma explicação em inglês também do que é esse evento. É um evento internacional, né? É um evento que trata do direito concorrencial, um evento organizado pelo Grupo de Estudos de Direito da Concorrência do Mackenzie, juntamente com a Ascola Brasil, Academia de Sociais para Competir de Novo, em parceria com a Universidade de São Paulo, USP de Ribeirão Preto e o IBRAC. Depois trarei mais detalhes desse evento também. Eu, para iniciar, eu gostaria de chamar aqui a professora Juliana Oliveira Domingues, da Universidade de São Paulo, professor Marco Antônio Losquiavo, Leandro de Barros, do Mackenzie, e o doutor René Medrado, representando o IBRAC. E também chama, para que juntos a nós, please, o professor Bruce Warhol, da Durham University. O Mackenzie é uma universidade profissional e todos os nossos eventos oficiais iniciam com uma devocional. Então eu convido o pastor Piacente para que faça a devocional para o nosso dia. Obrigado. Obrigado. Bom dia, meus queridos amigos. É muito bom estar aqui. É sempre muito bom abrir os eventos com essa oportunidade que nós temos de refletir acerca de questões que dizem respeito ao nosso cotidiano e que estão naquilo que diz também uma parte da identidade institucional do Mackenzie, que é a nossa confessionalidade. Alguém uma vez afirmou o seguinte, eu gosto do impossível porque lá a concorrência é menor. Eu gosto do impossível porque lá a concorrência é menor. E quem afirmou isso foi um grande empresário, um visionário, Alguém que foi questionado, inclusive, pelas suas grandes ideias, o seu nome é Al, é Al Disney. Al Disney. Ele certa vez disse essa frase, isso marcou a história dele e marcou também a nossa história. Às vezes a gente se esquece que concorrência, de fato, é algo que faz parte do nosso cotidiano e precisa ser tratado com o devido cuidado. Eu trago aqui para vocês um texto do profeta Oséias que fala da concorrência. Esse também é um tema das escrituras. Lá a concorrência tinha um aspecto interessante, porque às vezes as pessoas eram desleais e não faziam a concorrência da maneira correta. E a maneira como faziam isso é que as suas balanças não eram honestas. Eu gostaria que você prestasse muita atenção no que o texto diz porque ele pode ser um alerta para todos nós. A concorrência desleal tem um fim bem ruim e precisamos estar atentos para não cair nos seus erros. Diz assim o texto, os israelitas são como os cananeus, as pessoas são todas iguais. São desonestos e usam balanças falsas para explorar os outros. Eles dizem, é verdade que somos ricos, mas ninguém pode nos acusar de termos ajuntado a nossa riqueza por meios desonestos. Porém, eu, o Senhor, sou o Deus de vocês, desde que os tirei do Egito, e farei com que vocês voltem a morar em barracas, como, como moraram quando eu me encontrei com vocês no deserto. Um alerta para todos nós. Balanças desleais, concorrência desleal. Parece que o universo conspira contra... Parece que as pessoas são pegas por acaso. Hum, nada de acaso nisso. Existe alguém governando todas as coisas. Seu nome é Deus. E ele tudo vê. E ele sabe quando as balanças são desonestas. Deus abençoe a sua vida. E você pratique aquilo que é certo. Da maneira certa. Porque isso é bom e agradável. Minha oração por vocês é para que vocês tenham um grande evento nesta manhã. E muito obrigado pela oportunidade. Sejam todos muito bem-vindos nesta manhã. E eu espero que, de fato, o Mackenzie, com a sua visão cristã de mundo, com os seus valores, os seus ideais, a sua identidade, contribua para uma concorrência justa, com temor e tremor diante de Deus. Obrigado e até a próxima oportunidade, quando Deus permitir. Até logo. Obrigado. Bruce vai apresentar. Oi, eu sou Bruce, sou o Marco Marcos. Eu sou o Bruce, sou o Marco Marcos. Eu sou o Bruce, sou o Marco Marcos.
Sorry, technical issues. Oh, muito bem. Uh, so, let's start again. Uh, a few months ago, well, first of all, welcome to Mackenzie. And for those that uh, who are watching us in YouTube, you are very welcome too. Uh, some few months ago, Professor Marco Boschiavo came up to me and said that a professor from UK was coming to, to Mackenzie and he's a competition law professor. And we thought, well, wow, it's perfect. So let's invite him to, to teach for our PhD and LLM, master's students in a class. And then we, are, we realized that the professor that was coming to Mackenzie was Bruce Warhoff. Then we thought, it's not fair only the PhD and the LLM students have this chance. So let's open to the undergraduate students also. But at the time, I was talking with Professor, uh, Professor Juliana Dominguez, that is co-chair of a school and professor of USP. And we was planning to, to have a kind of a scholar conference, a scholar lecture here uh, at Mackenzie. And for coincidence, I received a call from Ibrak that's today represented by Pene Medal, its vice president, telling that Ibrak was organizing a week to promote competition law at universities, in different universities. Join two universities and each conference. And of course, uh, I can say that Mackenzie and USP Ribeirão with Professor Juliana, we are already partners. And then we thought, why don't you do a big event? A big event with a scholar of Brazil, Mackenzie, USP, Ribeirão Preto, and Ibrak, all together to receive Professor Bruce Warhoff. And I'm truly honored, Professor Bruce, to have you here with us. I invite you to give your lecture, and I recommend it to all the students and academics to read your most recent book. It's really amazing. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. It's uh, my first time in South America, and my first time in Brazil. And I can just say I'm just—it's just been a wonderful 
think finally on Saturday, it was just a wonderful six days so far. Uh, I, I really enjoyed it. Thank you for your hospitality. Sir, you have shown a bit. I really appreciate that. I'm Bruce Wardhoff. I'm a competition law professor at the University of Durham in Connecticut. Um, I realize I'm speaking in English, for which I apologize. Um, I more the language of the language of my hosts, but unfortunately, it's a monolingual tradition among anglophones. Uh, if I um, if I speak too fast or you just don't. Sometimes it's just not clear. Please feel free to raise your hand and interrupt. I'm mean, very much used to that uh, in the class. I do have a tendency to uh, to speak rather rapidly, so uh, so just alert me if that becomes a problem. Thank you. Today's uh, talk uh, is really uh, based upon a book that uh, was published this autumn by Cambridge University Press. This was in effect my lockdown baby. Uh, I had nothing to do, I don't watch TV, so I decided to make my book, which was fine. I had, uh, in, in, in England, we were more or less under house arrest and we couldn't leave the house for more than an hour a day. So writing a book uh, sort of made up for it. And the, the book actually started ironically as a, um, I, I was thinking uh, before all of the COVID broke out about working on competition and sustainability. And in fact, at the, really the last event that I participated in prior to the lockdown was a, a reception given by one of the uh, legal academic societies in uh, legal societies in the UK. Right? I spoke with the acquisitions editor at Cambridge uh, University Press about it. They were interested, and then 10 days later, we went into lockdown. So the focus of my thoughts and the focus of my book changed. And it, it became a much more general book looking at uh, competition in crisis. Because we've, we've had a series of crises uh, in, in recently. In fact, we get new crises every day, and, and the English word unprecedented to describe each new crisis seems to be overused. Uh, so this, this book really looks at the typical view, and, and we saw this view, at least I saw this view in the UK, and I think it was a view that was uh, prominent throughout the world uh, during the early stages of, of COVID, was that competition law tends to get in the way of firms uh, ability to effectively mitigate or somehow deal with crisis. And you see here industry saying this all the time. And their argument is just, just leave us alone, suspend the operation of competition law, and we'll figure it out and we'll solve it for you. Okay, now uh, a very clear case of this uh, was, in, it was in England, the UK. I don't know what was happening here, but in the UK during the early stages of COVID, people got kind of weird and started panic buying toilet paper. Uh, and so it's stripping the shelves of the supermarket of toilet paper, you can see, you know, the fact that to the extent that they had to put a, uh, a quota on the amount of toilet paper you could buy in the, the, the supermarkets. And so this caused a bit of a problem, a panic, and uh, in our uh, financial newspaper, the Financial Times, uh, there was an article reporting that the relaxation of competition um, uh, rules would help suppliers coordinate, uh, say, the supply of toilet paper, which is in the forefront of everybody's minds at that time. Uh, and so they could have people from Tesco and Sainsbury's, those are two of the four largest uh, grocery chains in, in the UK sit around and talk about toilet paper production, supply, and distribution without fear of prosecution. Is that really a good thing? I don't think so, and I will show you why I don't think so. Uh, but it, it also, relaxation of competition rules also extended to the sphere of uh, not just toilet paper and talking about toilet paper and other groceries, but, uh, but also to mergers. We had here, um, 
uh, a few months later, a comment about a blocked merger by our competition authorities. A blocked merger of two of the largest sportswear chains in the UK that sold trainers and tennis shoes. In fact, we had one player on the market, and the chairman of uh, one of the companies said that blocking of the merger is just absurd given economic uh, conditions uh, caused by COVID. But this was not just a COVID issue. Uh, we had uh, we see the, the claims being made in very prominently in sustainability concerns. The relax that uh, competition law is 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 blocking an effective or effective means of resolving sustainability issues. We need, we need to relax competition law so these environmental problems can be better solved. This, my argument also applies to this. This is this is the wrong way to uh, to uh, deal with these issues, uh, and it's 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 the wrong way. And I think I will address it briefly from a theoretical perspective. Uh, but also, history shows us that every time the competition has been relaxed in the face of the so-called crisis, for, uh, the crisis isn't solved, and further problems tend to result from. From this. So, uh, in fact, uh, often the relaxation, so called relaxation or suspension of competition rules, increases or aggravates the problem. Uh, I have a brief outline here. I'll look at the purpose and structure of competition law. My focus is primarily on uh, the European regime. Uh, that was the regime I was working on. But I, I think the, the claims are generally applicable. Uh, the cases are. With one exception, one day exception uh, from Europe. So I'll, I'll introduce those and we'll talk about that. So here's the theoretical argument. The theoretical argument is quite simple. What is the purpose of competition law and competition rules? Essentially, the market is the way society grows wealth. Okay, and so that's 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 the premise of, of orthodox. Uh, microeconomics, uh, and it's the starting point, I think, for any investigation. And principles of orthodox price theory show that in competitive markets, actions of all involved lead to sort of wealth tra transfers of goods and services and money, uh, which lead to a, a wealth maximizing and optimal distribution. Okay, we learned that in the first couple of weeks of, of this basic microeconomics, what we talked about. But unfortunately, perfect competition is uh, never exists. It's like Plato's form. Okay, it never really exists. Uh, and there's always these, uh, how should we say, design flaws in the market called, um, or bugs in the market called uh, uh, market failures. And the big market, uh, market failures tend to prevent this so called invisible hand to direct. Uh, the wealth optimization. And the purpose of competition law is to address one of these market failures, and that's the market failure caused by monopoly. I mean, this is all simple. I mean, you, 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 you're all competition experts. I'm sorry, I'm not preaching to the converted. And we see the, the, the monopoly problem manifesting itself in three ways collusion, monopolies, and merger. And competition rules in the national league order address these problems. And we do this in the EU with Article 101, Article 102, and through merger regulations. So, if the purpose of competition law is to eliminate the market failure associated with monopoly, okay, this is the purpose, mm -hmm. and it aids in a more effective, better wealth maximizing distribution of goods. Uh, services but now if you suggest that you relax competition the competition rules in the face of a crisis you are in effect suggesting that more monopoly in the market will solve the problem okay and that seems to be prima facie or at least more than prima facie, absurd, right? Okay, so the causes of these crises you're in effect saying are caused by too much competition or otherwise put, too little monopoly. 
Hmm. Think of it. But if you look at all of these crises, none of them, none of them are caused by too little monopoly. Okay? There's always some other shock or, 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 or some other cause, other than too little monopoly, that's in the soup that causes this, 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 this nasty crisis. Typically, it's unexpected drops or increases in demand, so-called shocks, or other forms of market failure, um, particularly in, in the environment price problem. Externalities are, are an issue, or the market failures caused by public and quasi-public goods, uh, inefficient in, uh, ability to, to, or insufficient ability to, uh, in effect, privatize the outcome. Now, if we really want the, I think the strongest evidence uh, for all of this historically comes from America during the Great Depression, okay, between the second and the first and second world wars. Now, we know there's little consensus in the uh, economic history uh, uh, literature regarding the causes of the Great Depression. The usual suspects involve things like uh, banking runs, panics, when people see a line out, not knowing the difference between an insolvent bank and an illiquid bank. Uh, costly credit intermediation, there was a lot of, uh, before the Great Depression, credit, at least in the US, was quite easy to come by. Uh, when, when things tightened up, of course, that froze the credit markets. Uh, and thus smaller businesses and individuals had less access to, to credit, uh, drop in demand, and so on and so forth. And of course, the major suspect, this is the Milton Friedman suspect, is monetary policy linking the US dollar to the gold standard. Okay, and the data they have policies. But whatever, whatever the causes were, and we really don't need to go into that, I can say two things. None of those caused by the two monopoly. And none of uh, and but the and the effects were quite clear. During the Great Depression, there was an obvious, profound drop in demand across the economy for almost every uh, good good and service. <laughs> this became a problem in the election of 1932. Uh, the then President Herbert Hoover. He was uh, an engineer by profession. He looked for technocratic solutions, couldn't find any. Uh, people were fed up with him and voted Franklin Roosevelt uh, into power. He took over in January of 1933. And uh, Roosevelt brought in the New Deal. In fact, there were two New Deals. The cornerstone of the first New Deal was brought in in Roosevelt's first 100 days. It was the National Industrial Recovery Act of 1933. Now, the National Industrial Recovery Act, in effect, repealed Section 1 of the Sherman Act. Section 1 of the Sherman Act being the anti-cartel provision. Okay. It allowed industries to develop codes of fair competition. And upon approval by the president or its delegates, these codes will be the standards of fair competition for trade and the industry, or for that means. Violation of the code is, would be a criminal offense. Uh, the aim of this act was to, was to ensure that the benefits of fair competition would flow to employees, and it required the codes and include provisions for unionization and minimum wages. So it was an idea to send money to workers through restricting competition. Um, and Essentially, the codes, uh, various industries were coded. Uh, these, these included uh, arrangements of limited competition, including minimum prices. This was, remember, 20, 1911. So this was 21 years, roughly, after the uh, Dr. Miles decision, which uh, in the U.S. said that uh, uh, minimum prices is a hard work cartel. So legislatively repealed that. Restrictions on production, investment in plants and equipment, and work week. All of those are hardcore cartels, all of them. So this is perfectly legal, 
And in fact, it's not just perfectly legal, it's if the industry adopts it, it's criminal for you to go against <laughs> Resale price maintenance, again, a hardcore cartel. Base point pricing, open price systems, in other words, transparency in the prices. Minimum price, uh, industry wide RPM was the uh, standard way of, uh, of uh, it was a standard provision in, in most codes. Did it work? Absolutely not. In fact, it didn't work to the extent that it, uh, uh, recent economic studies tend to show a prolonged depression by 18 to 20. Why? Okay, first of all, yeah, workers got some of the benefits of the increase in wages, but the wages <laughs> only in those industries that were covered by codes. Not all industries were covered by codes. Take the coal sector, the bituminous sector, that's the soft coal. Wages rose, uh, that, that, that was a coded industry, Wages rose 40%. Great for those who were employed in the industry. In the hard coal sector, wages dropped. Coal mines or coal mines, what's the difference? Wages rose faster than prices. So if you were in a coated industry, the benefits of all of this went to the workers in coated industries. Now, what happens if your wage prices go up. What does that do to your incentives to uh, hire people? It's a disincentive, mm -hmm. right? So how does that help unemployment? It doesn't. In fact, it prevents mitigation of any unemployment problem. Okay? And uh, it, because you need to increase prices, demand is down, so you're gonna reduce production. So it was, it was not just an ineffective way, it was contrary to a goal of increasing production within the industry. There's a similar attempt in the UK, cartelization of the coal industry. It didn't work. Uh, essentially, instead of setting up a national monopoly, which later happened, the, uh, the industry was cartelized on a regional basis. And the reason for its failure was the coal industry in the UK during that time, did what all cartels do. Its members cheated on each other. So it failed as a result. Okay. So we so I mean there is your clearest example, 1932, the National Industrial Recovery Act uh, was ruled unconstitutional on other grounds. Uh, Roosevelt provided a second new deal to sort of deal with this problem. But the data shows, I think, that this prolonged depression uh, extensively just didn't work. It couldn't. Post World War II in Europe, and since most of my examples, well, all of my examples henceforth will be European, this is the basis. Uh, the Europe, EU develops a competition regime, historically likely because of American influence via the Marshall Plan and the you know, uh, anti. Cartel regime. The first um, aspect or elements of the uh, competition regime was in the European Coal and Steel Treaty, which uh, those uh, those provisions were reproduced in the 1957 Treaty of Rome, which set up the European Economic Community, uh, the forerunner of the European Union. Uh, and they have not changed. The treaty provisions have remained verbatim since then. You may know Article 101 prohibits uh, the agreements that are incompatible with the internal markets, uh, which have their object or effect, the prevention, restriction, or distortion of competition. And then it lists five um, what we now tend to regard as hardcore cartel activities. And Article 103, however, is very interesting. What it does is it sets up exceptions to Article 101. It recognizes that not all forms of collaboration or so-called collusion 
are necessarily bad. Okay. Certain agreements uh, between undertakings, between competitors, undertaking, by the way, is just Euro speak for firm. Okay, it's just the Euro European uh, It comes from a German. Um, I think it is. Uh, uh, but it's somehow been translated into the, the general European Union discourse to, to, uh, to mean firm. Uh, so, Article 1013 recognizes that in certain cases, uh, if four criteria are met, then a agreement among competitors uh, is perfectly permissible. So it has to improve the production or distribution of goods or technical or economic progress. It has to allow consumers a fair share of the resulting benefit. It cannot impose restrictions that are not indispensable to attaining the objectives of the, of, of the goal. And it doesn't eliminate competition in respect to a substantial part of the world. Now, in crisis situations, I think it is fair to say that the criteria for our, our, to, to satisfy Article 1013 were taken quite liberally. And the prior to 2004, it was up to the Commission, the European Commission, to approve an agreement as to whether or not it satisfied those conditions. And up to 2004, the Commission was, to put it bluntly, quite relaxed about uh, the, um, uh, how it would, uh, how it would, about the sort of evidences and, and the burden of proof in crisis situations with regard to three. And there are two early cases that are, are kind of neat. Um, and, and these cases are essentially parallel. It's the synthetic fiber and the Stichten vaccine, which is the Dutch brick industry case. Both of them about 10 years apart. And in fact, they're so identical that the commission decision in the Dutch brick industry case repeats verbatim the same reasoning uh, and, uh, of, uh, in the, the synthetic fibers case. Um, so, so closely that if two students submitted those as assignments, one would worry about collusion between the two students or flagrants. Both, uh, both industries, both cases uh, were, were characterized by an industry-wide crisis with permanent shifts in consumer demand. There's a drop in the 80s in the demand for synthetic fibers, nylon, rayon, and the like, which were used in clothing. We had uh, imports from uh, primarily Turkey of uh, natural fabrics. In the Dutch brick industry, because of construction and the change in architectural styles, people were no longer using bricks of a certain sort. One thing about the European brick market is that each country and sometimes each region in a country have their own uh, brick styles. So for instance, Dutch bricks would never be used in German buildings and vice versa, not just for the transport costs, but also for, for, for the aesthetics. Both industries were characterized because of the drop in demand by overcapacity. And in both industries, the, agree uh, the industry wanted to establish agreements among members of the industry to coordinate a reduction in capacity, to sort of have an orderly contraction of the industry. And this orderly contraction in both cases was approved. Uh, how it would meet the criteria is that the more efficient plants would remain open. And this is in paragraph 34, synthetic filers and brick industry paragraph 36. So therefore it would contribute to uh, the productive efficiencies. Coordination and restructuring permits it to be done in acceptable social conditions. In other words, to avoid sudden mass layoffs that are associated with plant closure. Customers would benefit uh, in the long term by a revitalization of the industry. 
and there's residual competition would remain. This is complete nonsense, absolute nonsense, particularly in the Dutch brick industry case. Why? They were relying on competition from outside the area. Now, think in the Dutch brick industry case, but I just told you about bricks. You can't use German bricks in Dutch houses. But more significantly in bricks, bricks are heavy. They cost a lot to transport. So you can't even economically bring in bricks. Even if you could use German bricks in Dutch houses, it would just be uneconomical to do so. So, so in fact, accepting fiction as evidence in these cases was part and parcel of the way that the commission resolved this. And I point out that, you know, the criteria were taken too loosely, possibly, uh, were taken loosely, possibly too loosely, and not a great deal of evidence, okay? And we have a, a change in Europe, uh, thank goodness, near the 21st century. We start seeing a more economic approach with the European Commission demanding greater uh, and more detailed economic analysis. The reason for this was really twofold. Oh, well, I would say twofold. There's a number of reasons for this. The first reason was as a result of litigation losses by the Commission. They lost a few merger cases, and the European Court says your economic analysis is just so bad. We just can't, we just can't accept uh, That's not really a good thing to be told for a competition agency to be told. The second is in 2004, the European Union expanded from 15 member states to 25 member states. Now, prior to 2004, as I mentioned, the Commission would examine proposed agreements between competitors to see if they were acceptable under Article 103. When you had 15 member states, that took, because of Commission resources, that took 18 to 24 months. Markets would change. You throw in another 10 member states, how long is that going to take? Right? Furthermore, if you devote all of these resources to looking at anti competitive agreements, you take away resources from actually going out and finding cartels because cartelists aren't going to advertise to the commission. They're not going to seek pre approval of their price fixing. So just a bad allocation of resources. So in 2004, Europe switched from a system of pre-approval, pre-notification, to a system of self-assessment. So now undertakings, firms would have to decide for themselves whether the agreement is anti-competitive, whether the agreement could take advantage of Article 101. Okay? And this is, this is good, but it, as we'll see later, is also a bit of a problem. Okay. Now, there are two elements to this more economic approach. First of all, only economic concerns matter to competition law and to orthodox price theory, uh, possibly game theory, is or are the appropriate tools to measure this. Now, this is good because it makes self-assessment easier. We all know what the criteria are. We get the economists in. The economists can use these tools. Economists can then show, show the benefits. So we can do the self-assessment. We don't have to worry about, say, the commission's institutional memory, relying when we're in, with, with the Dutch, Dutch brick industry, relying on some debt fibers, okay? About other non economics So it sets a nice, easy standard metric um, to, to you know, deal with these metrics. But the, the new metric gives us different results, interesting results. The clearest and, and, and most interesting result, I think, is in the uh, Competition Authority versus the Beef Industry Development Society, the BIDS case coming out of Ireland. I put the Tesco case in there because this, this is an uh, illustration of um, crisis washing to justify a cartel. And then the ACM is the Dutch, Chip, uh, Dutch Competition Authority. And they had a very uh, interesting analysis of the sustainability uh, uh, and 
and uh, animal welfare initiative in the chicken industry. I'll get to these pieces. The bids case is very similar to the synthetic fibers and the Dutch chicken industry. Overcapacity in the Irish beef slaughter industry. Ireland raises a lot of cows, be slaughtered, and it doesn't eat the amount of cows it raises and exports, significant exports. The cause of the problem was when Ireland joined the EU in 73, 1973, it was able to uh, tap into the common agricultural policy funds and receive subsidies. Okay, subsidies is now the cause of the crisis. Uh, so, uh, and to subsidize the beef production process. And once you receive subsidies, that divorces the production from market realities. So they started producing more subsidized production of more and more beef, but nobody could eat it, and you couldn't even export that amount of beef, okay? Industry realized it had an overcapacity problem. It hired McKinsey Consulting to come in and advise us. The net result of the consultation was that you need to cut capacity by just under a third, 32%. So the beef industry formed the Irish Beef Industry Development Society with the goal of coordinating uh, an orderly restructuring of the industry to reduce capacity, just as was done in the um, uh, 10, 10 years before that in the uh, uh, Dutch brick industry and um, 20 years before it in the um, synthetic fiber industry. The beef industry approached the Irish Competition Authority. This was still under the old regime, the Irish Competition for Assistance. The Irish Competition Authority refused to engage. So now you figure it out, it's your problem. So the beef industry developed uh, a regime by which there would be an orderly reduction of uh, capacity in the slaughter industry. Those leaving the industry would be compensated by those remaining in the industry. There would be strict limits on the production of, um, uh, of uh, meat. If you exceeded the limits, you would be fine. Uh, the Irish Competition Authority said, no, this is a problem, we can't do this, okay? And it uh, uh, went to the European Court of Justice. There's a means by which you can refer cases involving your, your tech, re require the resolution of the European law problem to uh, national cases to the European courts. And the European Court said, no, this was a by object violation of Article 1011, right? Any reduction in Capacity is a reproduction, is a restriction by object of competition. It's by object. So some justification was required under Article 113, and the Irish Supreme Court referred it back to the trial court to hear this justification. And the trial court, interestingly enough, the judge seemed to be very sympathetic to it. it was judge Justice McKenzie, who later became a member of the Irish Supreme Court. Um, heard the arguments, but the commission intervened. The commission has a right to appear as an amicus uh, and argued that the provisions were contrary to 103. As a result, the uh, Beef Industry Development Society withdrew its actions before the so, it collapsed. Now, the core of the European uh, uh, Court of Justice's reasoning as to why such industry-wise uh, agreements are found in this paragraph, paragraph 35, and it says that the, uh, the principle of European competition, of the European competition regime, is that each economic operator must independently determine their own market strategy. Obviously, industry-wide agreement is a violation of that principle. 
This, we see this reasoning appear today. Uh, in fact, that the most recent case I saw today, the European Court of Justice reproduced these words in a decision in January. So it's still a valid principle. Uh, so any industrial collaboration that eliminates the possibility of an undertaking from formulating its own market strategy is a violation of European competition law, unless it meets one of the three. So this makes it difficult, slightly more difficult for companies in Europe to organize themselves in this way. European dairy case, I'm not gonna get into it much in this talk, it's in the book. Uh, this is an out and out cartel among the dairies and the milk farmers. The, the milk industry, dairy industry, lobbied for political support and said, well, we're not making enough money. Well, the dairies were making a ton of money. Well, most of the dairies were making a ton of money. The farmers were not. The dairies were simply squeezing the farmers. Okay. So the farmers start, and the farmers are well organized in so they, they use the, their political clout, their lobbying potential to, uh, to appeal to parliaments. They got parliamentary support because after all, everybody loves the farmers. Uh, early gay motion and support uh, of this arrangement. This is, this is problematic because you can get the politicians involved. Unless you have a strong competition agency, bad things happen. Uh, the competition authorities, the, the, the OFT, predecessor to the CMA, investigated this and said, no, there's no trouble here. There's no problem with the industry. You're just trying to justify a cartel. So this is a clear example of a problem we see when we argue about suspending competition rules in a crisis, is that people will dream up a crisis so the competition rules will be suspended so that they can justify a cartel, which doesn't alleviate the price of the crisis. It merely raises the price to go into uh, an increase in profits. Final European case I want to talk about, at least in collusion, is the Dutch chicken of tomorrow case. Kip van, Kip van Warden in uh, Animal welfare uh, is rather important in, in the Netherlands. Uh, the Netherlands has a political party, the Party for Animals. It receives just over 5% of the votes, and with the proportional representation system, it has seats in both houses of parliament. So people do take, the Dutch public takes animals seriously. And this was a controversial uh, proposal uh, involving animal welfare considerations in the chicken industry, where the industry, recognizing public sentiment, Sought a minimum standard of treatment. In other words, bigger cages, better food, more uh, less light, give the chickens a chance to sleep in the dark for their short lived lives. Okay? Price was not going to be part of the agreed standard. Essentially, what they wanted to do was increase the, the, the size of the chicken cages. Now, what happens if you increase the size of the chicken cages is that you raise fewer chickens. So that's going to be uh, should we say an output reduction? So, but as a result, chicken welfare would go up. The chickens would be marginally happier. Prices, because there'd be fewer chickens produced, would also go up. Okay, sounds like a win win situation, except how much does the prices go up? And the fact is, how much are people willing to pay to buy the chickens this happiness? Okay. And the, so the Dutch Competition Authority ran uh, a very good running consumer surveys on a willingness to pay basis and found that consumers are only willing to pay a small amount for happy chicken. In other words, 68 euro cents per kilo. Uh, there would be an environmental effect of an environmental gain of about 14 cents per kilo. And there's no positive effect on public health. So the benefits to the consumers would be about 82 cent euro cents per kilo chicken meat. However, fewer chickens, happy chickens, more costly to raise chickens, 
cost to raise chickens, one euro 46. Uh, so the prices would have to go up at least one euro 46, but consumers are only going to pay 82 cents. Problem. Dutch Competition Authority says, no, nope, you can't do this. Now, in a country like the Netherlands, where animal welfare is significant, you can imagine the outcry. There's a rather rude English expression. Um, so the costs exceed the benefits. So it was held to be an anti-competitive agreement. But interestingly enough, the Dutch chicken industry just didn't give up. They realized there's a public sentiment involved. And so what they did is they went to their plan B, but their plan B turned out to be better than their plan A. Okay. Independently, the major supermarket in the Netherlands, Albert Heijn, developed a set of standards for chicken welfare and the conditions under which chickens were raised. We have a gold standard, a silver standard, and a bronze standard. So you look at the Olympics of chicken meat. Um, and we're gold standard now, gold standard, more welfare, happier chicken, more expensive, silver and bronze. And there are standards about day and night, standards about feed, standards about access to doors and river cages, etc. And these standards were then verified by the Dutch Society for Animal Welfare. So an independent, respected body verifying the standards. They rolled out this, uh, this, this production method. And then a few months later, the number two chain followed. It's Jumbo, it used to be seen in a thousand. And this was successful. This was accepted by the Dutch, so people could voluntarily pick the, the, the animal welfare of the chicken that they were consuming, animal welfare level. There was still mean chicken or unhappy chicken available, but people consumption switched away from that. And in fact, the amount of that of, of mean chicken um, uh, shrunk on the supermarket shelves. You can still get it, but not much is sold. And the animal welfare conditions of chicken chickens raised under these standards exceeded the animal welfare conditions which were proposed under the original standard. So everybody was better off. The consumers were forced to pay extra. The chickens are happier for their short lives. And consumers have a choice of different classifications based upon willingness to pay welfare levels. And the standards are verified by a respectful organization. If you want higher animal welfare, you pay more, but you're not forced to pay. Now note, and all of these problems, synthetic fibers, Dutch chicken, dairy industry, Irish beef, none of these problems were caused by too little monopoly in the market, right? So theoretically, we're reducing competition, relaxing the competition rules is not the solution. Turning to the next example, financial crisis. How much longer do I have to talk? I can probably as I can talk all day. <laughs> When, when do you want me to shut up? Yeah, have another 20, 30 minutes. 20, 30 minutes, okay. Fair enough. Is that okay with you? You, you, you have the monopoly of the time. I have the monopoly. Uh, I hate monopolists. <laughs> Self hate. Um, okay, the financial crisis, 2008, 2009, multiple causes, right? Moral hazard in the banking industry, opaque to the securities, credit rating issues. This batch of funding and all certain moments. Just a just a gigantic story. Uh, the result was undercapitalization of financial institutions. When banks are undercapitalized, you, you know you have to have a capital reserve. So if you're undercapitalized, money has to go into your capital reserve, so you can't use the money to lend to people. And as you know, you've taken you've all taken commercial law. You know that uh, credit and lending is sort of the oil that, uh, that, that lubricates the, uh, the machinery of commerce. Okay, no, uh, it's just like an engine. No oil, the engine ceases. Okay, so 
uh, undercapitalization, cutbacks, lending to the real, real economy problems. Two responses um, globally, at least two responses. The first was state aid. State aid to recapitalize and support lending to the real economy, you know, given basically bailing bank size. And then as much as I hate mergers and state aid, I think we had no choice then, but that's a separate brand. The other case was merger, in the, uh, at least in the UK and the Netherlands. Well, focus more on the merger response. In the UK, the government managed or had to bail out the state aid a number of financial institutions. And you know, so every day or every week you see another bank being um, bailed out. And that soon became unpopular, right? The whole idea of the government handing taxpayers hard-earned money over to the bankers that caused the problem. At least that's the, the popular discourse. Nearing the end of the bailing out phase, a problem arose with the uh, Halifax Bank of Scotland. Okay, one of the larger banks. The Halifax Bank of Scotland owned 20% of the UK mortgage market, 16% of the savings market, and used, but used the wholesale financing, particularly leveraging into American securities uh, to finance its operations. Uh, there was problems in the UK in 2007, so its solution was to increase corporate lending. Probably not good. They got into trouble very fast because of their exposure to the US, and particularly the US subprime mortgage market. In contrast, Lloyds Bank is another large bank, was in a very solid position, had no such exposure. And the, in the government's mind, in Gordon Brown's mind, it was the ideal candidate to take over each boss before it failed. Okay? So the government encouraged a merger. Encouraged is a sort of a mild way to put it. Okay? And the idea was with a merger, each boss would be rescued, but more importantly, we wouldn't need to be seen to be putting public funds into yet another bank. Okay. As was the case with all mergers, this had to be looked at uh, on an expert, in this case, on an expedited basis by the competition authorities. Competition authorities were able to look at it within a, uh, a week or so because they'd done some um, earlier investigations uh, of potential mergers. So they knew the market quite well. They found that with less competition in so-called current accounts, current accounts are the sort of accounts that everybody has to sort of pay in their paycheck, pay the bills from, so on and so forth. Whether, and this is whether you're a, uh, uh, an individual or, or a business. It would also reduce competition to smaller and medium enterprises and competition in the mortgage market. And the merged entity would be the clear leader or uh, 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 banks that held personal current accounts. Uh, and the post merger HHI in the personal market would be 1950 with a delta of 500. Those of you who know merger control you know this is a bit of a problem. Okay, so the competition authorities were going to block this. They say, nope, can't do it, anti-competitive. The word that the competition authorities came out late one day and overnight, and I literally mean overnight, the government changed the rules to allow an exemption to, for the, to allow approve mergers, the government to approve mergers, quote, in the interest of maintaining the stability of the UK financial system. So the next morning, under this new rule, the merger was approved. Consequence of the merger, first of all, well, state aid, the bailout was still needed. Oops, 17 billion. Secondly, it concentrated the further, concentrated the UK bank market even further. 
This concentration was primarily felt in Scotland, where essentially the new merged entity had no competitor. And we had a similar case, or there was a similar case in, uh, in the Netherlands with Fortis, AB, and Ambro. And studies there show, show that that concentration led to a drop of uh, rates on savings accounts, interest rates paid on savings accounts, and the drop led to a decrease of about 70 million euros in 2010. And typically those who rely on interest from savings accounts tend to be, quote, less educated consumers with lower savings. So the merger had a disparate impact upon the uh, less wealthy people in the nations. Okay, the real problem with this, okay, is that at least in the UK, merger didn't solve anything. We still had the problem with the uh, state aid. So that was not a good thing. Merger concentrated the banking industry. Financial crisis is over. The merged entity still exists. The anti-competitive consequences of that merged entity are still seen in Scotland. Reduction in banks, okay? Uh, in banking capacity. So it wasn't even a are with us today. Let's look at COVID as a final. What did we see in COVID? We saw asymmetric shifts in demand, so an increased demand for some products, hand gel, face masks, decreased demand for others. Okay. Increased demand led to hoarding behavior, right? Everybody buys everything. People just got weird. Toilet paper, pasta, rice, that was all salt on the basis. And I guess it's sort of semi-rational. If you see toilet paper disappearing from the shelves, you go off by extra toilet paper. I know I do. Okay? And I consider myself a fairly rational um, to a point. Okay. Um, so what studies show that people just bought a little bit more, maybe 10%, 20%, percent not, you know, you know, the, the, the stories of, of people buying three times their yearly consumption. Um, that that, that was a few and far between. So, and as a result, but, but it was significant enough because of just on time deliveries to see gaps in the shelves and thus to cause panic. Okay. So in the early stages, and I've shown you on the slides, we saw suggestions that members of industry speak to coordinate. With, of course, with increases in demand, we saw increases in prices. It's normal market phenomenon. People don't understand that. They view it as price gouging. So there's a desire to crack down on price gouging. And we also saw desires to relax merger laws to make it easy for firms to survive. Now ask yourselves, does coordination bring in more and cheaper goods? No. <laughs> Prices rise as a result of scarcity. That sends a market signal to bring in more goods for the rest of the market to bring in more goods to compete the price down. Okay. Cartels do not necessarily bring in more goods. In fact, cartels have the opposite effect. If you have coordination in an industry, you are likely to build market barriers to prevent others from bringing in goods to compete your prices down, okay? Uh, so cartelists historically correct market barriers. Um, and market barriers can be of various sorts. Story. I was telling you about when I met my, uh, the, the acquisitions under Cambridge. On the way down to the, the, the reception in London, I was taking a cab to the train station. And we had uh, on, on the radio, there was somebody being on one of these talk radio shows, somebody from uh, a hand gel manufacturer okay, being interviewed. And the host of the radio show asked this person, well, look, hand gels in, in, in um, short supply. 
uh, antibacterial hand, or antiviral hangin? Can we not make our own? Can I not go to the drugstore, the pharmacy, and by rubbing alcohol, isopropyl alcohol, and some aloe jello cream, mix the two together, and now I've got hand gel. Okay? Obvious solution. In fact, so obvious if you look at the WHO health guidelines, that's a recommended solution. Okay, so it's not just an obvious solution, a legitimate solution to the problem. What does the hand gel person say? She says, no, you can't do that. You need ethanol alcohol. The problem with ethanol alcohol is it's really hard to get because you can drink it. Okay, that's the, the alcohol that's in alcohol beverages. 100% ethanol alcohol used to be a student's favorite. He makes it with a bit of water and food. You can very cheap drink. Okay. Um, everybody loves pharmacy students because they had access to that. Um, so ethanol alcohol is, is, is heavily regulated, often heavily taxed. But the, 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 the industry sponsor says, no, you need ethanol alcohol. Why? Because the molecules in isopropanol alcohol are bigger. And because they're bigger, they won't get into the pores of your skin to adequately kill the viruses that might be in that. Now, it's true, isopropanol alcohol molecules are bigger, but we're dealing with things at the molecular level. That's complete utter nonsense from a chemist's perspective. But yet you repeat that message out in the public, it doesn't work because of the pseudoscientific explanation. You are now erecting a market barrier. You are now encouraging people not to do the reasonable thing, but to go out and buy your overpriced product. Okay. So, and then supply goods, you, you, high price, you have a race to, um, to compete uh, to, to, to compete to bring in goods. Furthermore, motivation. Who's saying this? Industry. What's industry's motivation even in a crisis? Are they really that sort of public spirited? Or do they have their shareholders to answer to? And if they're both, who's crying the, the greatest? Be the shareholders they're answering to. In a crisis, if firms can cooperate, what would they agree upon? Store closures? Well, store closures give people geographic monopolies. And these geographical monopolies would, in COVID times, be reinforced by the fact that people can't travel as much. We weren't allowed to go out of the house for more than an hour a day. We sort of interfered with shopping. Product range. Remember the toilet paper slide at the beginning? Yeah, you reduce something like 47 different varieties of toilet paper in the UK. You reduce the, the availability now, probably to the most profitable. Okay. Distribution and stock levels, you can enforce cartels that way. Okay. Competition with vaccines and ventilators. There was competition, at least in the West, and by the West, I mean not Sputnik and not Sinovac, the Chinese and Russian vaccines. Beneficial cooperation is perfectly consistent with European and I believe with every other competition regime. If you look at the race to achieve the vaccine, the quality vaccine, you see that of the Western vaccines, all the Johnson and Johnson vaccines were developed by consortium, by cooperation, cooperative agreements. Okay, and because you had various consorti cons consortia competing against each other, there was a race to produce effective, you know, quality vaccines fast. Okay, and in fact. You know, these companies won that race. Okay, collaborative efforts, operating in a competitive agreement. Again, with design and production of ventilators and short supply at the early stages, which is a similar race. So, competition here, I think, helped resolve the crisis. Imagine what would have happened if a government, let's say, won't name China or, or, or Russia, said only one vaccine is going to be produced, no competition, you produce it, look at the results. Price gouging, when is the price too high? Okay, price gouging, everybody got concerned about prices. 
Uh, price gouging is only a competition problem if it's done by a dominant entity in the UK. In the US, price gouging is almost perfectly legal except in some states. And the uh, price gouging is typically reflected as a sum extra margin above costs, but determining from a uh, cost economy basis, determining costs is quite difficult. There's all sorts of problems determining exactly how much it costs, particularly when you have economies of scope. Preventing increases in prices will not lead to more goods. In fact, it probably does the opposite. If you can't get the goods in at the market price, you're not gonna bring the goods in, period, full stop. You, um, it, it reduces incentives to bring in new goods. Um, and in fact, if you look at price caps in other markets, the uh, New York um, Rent Control Act, which imposes price caps on rent in New York, is well studied. It shows that there's a problem. There was talk uh, a few weeks ago about in the UK imposing price caps on grocery items. And for once, our government had a reasonably sane idea and said, no, we won't do this. So thank goodness for a moment of sanity in our politics. Um, and now, the real problem with price, uh, price increases and, 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 and upwards price shocks is that competition law doesn't do well with that. That's really not a competition law. Okay. So we really can't ask competition lawyers to solve how we're going to get the price down. But what competition lawyers are good at are is looking at market barriers, entry barriers, like this nonsense about isopropyl and the holding the tube, and pointing out where the entry barriers are, because if you can eliminate the entry barriers, that allows for easier flow of goods into a market that will hopefully reduce the price. So the identification of such is the problem. Merger in COVID, it's the same problem as merger in financial institutions. Financial crisis is over. The hangover in the Scottish banking market is still there, it still exists. Merger and COVID would have led to the same situation. COVID would eventually, or did eventually go away to a certain extent. Um, uh, but if you allow for mergers, it still exists. Um, there's a saying, and this is the, the final uh, saying on the slide. In the UK, we have the Society for Prevention, Royal Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, because people get their children dogs at Christmas. They say a dog is for life, not for Christmas. So I've adopted this slogan, a merger is for life, not just for a crisis. So, okay, environment and sustainability. Yes, I know, credit in the use. What's the associated market failure involving the environment? I would suggest things like externalities, provision of crazy public and public goods. We're adding more monopolies, purities. I don't think so. Okay, externalities, good ideas would be to externalize costs, Cauchy bargaining, get strong assumptions there. You need strong initial assignments of rights. And in a large uh, community, you have full and free rider problems. Pijovian taxes to deal with externalities. Um, these are unpopular, you know, carbon taxes. Look at what happened with the, the yellow vests movement in, in France when they imposed carbon taxes and broke the price of fuel up. You had riots in the street, streets of Paris. Now, my claim and the claim I make in the book is there's nothing in the European competition rules that prevents um, uh, effective resolution of sustainability issues. The competition rules are good at preventing so-called greenwashing or crisis washing of claims. There are, in fact, nonsensical claims about how a certain arrangement would benefit the environment, but the arrangement is actually designed to increase producer welfare. Okay. The environment problem is a multifaceted problem. It cannot be solved through competition law alone. Okay. 
but more significantly, competition law doesn't really hinder solutions. Integrating, I argue also that integrating competition concerns, sorry, environmental and other such concerns into competition law is a problem. It involves a rule of law issue. Competition authorities should look at, in my mind, the competition aspects of a problem. They're neither trained, nor do they necessarily have the legal mandate to look at environmental concerns. Now, the goal in these cases is, in my mind, for competition authorities to investigate purported, uh, sorry, investigate agreements that are said to be in the interest of sustainability in the environment. You can assume that when two undertakings, two firms get together, they're doing so in a self-interested basis. That would be my premier facie assumption. They make environmental or other sustainability claims. I think the goal or the job of competition agencies here is to examine those claims. Because we can crisis wash, we can dress some things up as a crisis, get the politicians involved, whip up public opinion to sell something that actually doesn't solve the problem that expropriates consumer welfare. We saw that in the UK with the milk crisis, which is time and time again. Okay. The matter forward, I suggest, is similar to the Dutch chicken case. That's why I picked on the Dutch chicken case. Scrutinize the proposed agreements. Is this in the consumer's best interest? Is this the best way of advancing the goal? It's also consistent with or advances the consumer's interest. In the Dutch chicken case, we saw the first proposal. It didn't work. On a second proposal, that worked. Okay. But also in the Dutch chicken case, you had the heavy involvement of the Dutch competition authority guiding people. You didn't see that in the Irish beef industry case. That was, I think, the big flaw in the Irish case. Okay, now, yes, there may be some beneficial agreements. There may be a desire among companies, firms, to engage in this sort of industry-wide collaboration on green standards and the like. So the will so and I would give the, them the benefit of the doubt that this was honestly designed to alleviate the sustainability issue. But you still need so you're going to need some coordination. But you also need guidance. You need coordination because otherwise everybody every firm will develop its own standards. Customers will be, won't be able to compare things. Industry-wide standards are good involving coordination okay so you alignment on methodologies at minimum link later stuff a big global law firm suggested that about 57 percent of the clients are interested in working towards these goals but the problem is is without effective and appropriate guidance from the competition authorities firms are worried about crossing the line into collusion and collusion in Europe can get you fined in the hundreds of millions and billions of euros. Nobody wants to justify that to the shareholders. Okay, so in many instances, because of the risk of a fine, the project's been abandoned, and you reduce uh, and you reduce the risk of the fine by following explicit guidance or by obtaining comfort letters. And this is where I think uh, another area where I believe the competition agencies can get involved with the system is project. And so without the guidance, undertakings firms are, 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 are sort of will steer away. They're just not interested uh, in potentially crossing the line. And so the Dutch uh, competition authority here, I think, was uh, at the vanguard of all of this and um, uh, issue guidance. We're seeing new guidance in the UK. Uh, Europe has re uh, recently um, recently uh, rewritten its guidelines on horizontal cooperation. 
to include material that was taken out in the previous um, uh, version of the guidance uh, regarding environmental. Agreed codes of conduct uh, in general are not, and this is OEC guidance, are not anti competitive if the criteria are transparent and access is based on a non discriminatory basis. So that's, that's my goal. So I admit that's, that's, that's what I say in the book. I provided a copy of the book. Uh, I hope you've, uh, if you're in the invite, you received it. Don't feel obliged to read it, but it's there. And as I said before, don't talk to you, just anything. Okay. <laughs> 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 Okay, thank you very much, Professor Bruce from Durham University. Such an honor to have you here. Thanks for your lecture. I'd like to open the floor to some questions. Uh, current challenges of competition law. I would keep the book. So, what is the answer for a response to the crisis regarding competition law, respostas do direito à concorrência para a crise. So I open the floor for the audience and also for Marco, Juliana, and Henry, so they can ask for Professor Bruce your questions. And those from the audience, please introduce <laughs> yourself. Yeah. Hi, I'm Rafaela. Hello. I do have a question. Uh, in Brazil, a long time ago, we had a sugar problem. We were overproducing sugar. So the government solution was to buy all of this extra sugar and stock it and then let it rot. I was thinking, what do you feel, how do you feel about this solution? Okay. Well, that's the, the real problem is overproduction. Okay. Now, the so you it's it's what the government does. Okay. So the government spends a whole lot of tax. You know, they could have just burned the sugar. They could have just but instead made more money to store the sugar. Burning the sugar is going to be a problem. Um, so, okay. Now, if you have over production, uh, now you have what, what was the cause of the over production? Was it subsidies that caused the over production? So, the international crisis. The crisis sort of drop in demand. Okay. Now, the government spent a ton of money. Mm -hmm. How can it spend enough money? Okay. Uh, typically, we we look at these sort of government expenditures in the, in the form of state aid or subsidy because it's in effect a subsidy on unwanted goods. Because if the government didn't buy it, it wouldn't sell. So you're subsidizing that. Okay? Now you can do a number of, 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 of ways of supporting that. One way of supporting that is um, is often giving the money to companies. Uh, so that they continue on the same process. Another way of doing that is rather than giving the money to the companies, is telling the companies to shut things down and give the money directly to the workers. Okay, to for retraining or for, as a capital sum for a retirement. Or if you don't trust the trust the employees with a capital sum, give them an expansion. Okay, uh, cattle yeah. tend, tend to be dissipated. Uh, now, my my thinking, uh, without knowing the structure of, of, of the then Brazilian sugar industry, is that maybe maybe the money was misdirected, uh, and rather than, than on an annual basis buying too much sugar, spend a bit less money giving it 
and I see nothing wrong. In fact, I see everything. If you're giving money, uh, or you make the political choice to give money in uh, to industries to restructure the industry, giving that money as a form of government support, give it to the workers. I don't care if okay. I'm I'm a fairly capitalist, a fairly uh, small number of case. But isn't the whole point of investing in a company one of the reasons why you get a return is because you take the risk? Uh, you know, and you see this 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 being uh, if I invest in buy shares in a company through a stock broker in the UK, and every uh, I would see a, a little message warning: your investment, your investing in, in, in this means your capital is at risk. You might get less back than you put in. But because of the rest, you get a, a, a return. Employees don't have that choice. Okay, so the by by investing in the company, one way or the other, the owners of the company took that risk. The owners of the company had the possibility of did have a return. Uh, risk turns out bad. The bet turned out bad. That's that's market life. Uh, um, I mean, you know, the, the alternative suggestion is is you can get to the employees who have no such option. So thank you. That's that, that's just my uh, initial response, uh, semi ignorant response. Uh, hi, my name is Lisa. Um, Considering the subprime crisis, uh, do you think that European Union and UK regulations um, are more prepared to deal and to avoid another crisis like that? Uh, I think no. Bruce, no. can I add something to the question of Lisa? Then you can ask. A few, few months ago, we, we saw this problem going on in the US the bankruptcy of Signature Bank and Silicon, Silicon Valley Bank. And a couple weeks, and then there we have the intervention of the government yeah. saying all the people that have your money invested in, the, in those banks, you not lose anything. The federal government, you re reverse. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 essentially they, they increase the threshold of the deposit insurance to the normal process. And maybe it was a wrong message to the market say you don't don't worry if you take risks because at the end the government will help you. Maybe. Okay. And then a couple of weeks ago we saw the first first Republic Bank again the bankruptcy. And then the bank was took over by JP Morgan. And the American law said says uh, if you uh, um, uh, a big bank, yeah. okay, cannot buy uh, small banks, we will avoid the concentration of the market. But there is an exception in the law that if that bank is bound to to break, to fail, to fail a big bank can buy this, and it, it was exactly what happened. Yeah. So just adding this because I think it makes sense with the question here. Yeah. Uh, for for preparation for the crisis, uh, I think neither the uh, I think both the European Commission and the UK regulators were caught uh, off guard. Okay, they, what they did is they uh, I would say scrambled around, but they worked hard to develop uh, uh, strong solutions. The European uh, Commission, um, uh, I think, um, acted appropriately. Uh, they continued on business as normal. Uh, they obviously had a, a big um, uh, uh, task with state aid with all the subsidy programs uh, to, to support businesses that were going to go under. I'm not going to talk about state aid uh, in this talk. That's a whole actually kind of during the uh, take the state aid course. Um, uh, but uh, well, what we saw from coming out of the European Commission was the first ever use of comfort letters uh, to the uh, generic pharmaceutical industry about organizing uh, production of um, uh, uh, generic drugs. Uh, 
uh, to, to ensure that we got things such as personal um, supply chain problems with their bouncing problem. And so basically that precedent was set, so we're seeing more and more uh, uh, use of this, this means. And furthermore, the commission realizes hand in hand with comfort letters comes greater guidance, so they're joining and producing greater guidance. The UK was governmentally a mess. They were just celebrating the Boris Johnson victory and the, uh, how should we say, pulling out of the EU and all of that really horrible stuff. Uh, and they were in fact caught. Um, what the UK um, government's response was, it was a political response. It was to accept the grocery industry from the competition rules. Okay, so this collaboration could, did take place. We and uh, but the problem was the details of the collaboration were very opaque. We don't know exactly what was done. Okay. It was that precisely the wrong response. The CMA um, um, as a non as a non government non ministerial government agency uh, carried on business as normal. They didn't. They didn't produce uh, any significant guidance or anything like that. They, they dealt with mergers on um, a case, uh, case basis and applied the same rules. In fact, they said, given the, given the crisis, we're not going to change it's, it's, it's probably bad to change the rules, so we're going to change the rules. As to banks, okay. The real problem with banks is, first of all, moral hazard. Okay. Uh, if you're able to bet and, how should we say, um, and gain all the upside of the bet, gain all your winnings, and somebody else will reimburse you if you're a loser, you're just going to gamble, right? I'd love to see them like that, even though it is, even though it can be. Um, the problem is there's a significant moral hazard in the banking industry and in the reason. Um, the deposit uh, insurance thresholds. The real problem, though, is a lot of people aren't really aware of the difference between a solvency problem and a liquidity problem in banks. They're two different problems. Okay? When, you, when people hear a bank is illiquid, they think they're going to lose all their savings, they start lining up. When they hear a bank is insolvent, they start lining up. People start, and you know, a bank failure. How many failures are good? If you see the local department store going under, you know you can line up to get a good deal on the sale. Bank failure, the lineups are for different reasons. Okay. Um, and then if people see you not understanding what's going on, you start withdrawing it, and that sets off a vicious circle. Um, does raising uh, raising the level of deposit, uh, deposit protection help? I think it exacerbates the moral hazard problem. I think it, uh, uh, it may, I mean, there's ways of ensuring the risk. Maybe have a standard sort of minimum, and then if you want more deposit protection, the depositor pays a premium to protect their goods. They're, they're, they're I'm not sure what, what the, the way around. As to banks taking over failing banks, the the, the failing firm defense in the in the EU works as follows: is if, if, a, if a firm is going out of business, and if a dominant or a very large company is going to acquire the firm, it is acceptable only if those assets would inevitably flow to that to the acquiring firm. Okay. To that very firm. Not just some other not just any other firm in the market, but that firm in the market. Um, the problem though is in assessing this, this takes uh, a time period. The problem with the banks is you want these resolutions overnight. Typically in the US when you have a failing bank, they're taken over by the government at, at close of business on Friday, changes made over the weekend because banks didn't used to work on the weekends and then reopened under a new label uh, the next Monday morning. So you need just to reassure the clients 
that's sort of a, the European feeling, firm defense, that reassurance isn't present. So there may be an argument for expediting things. Was J.P. Morgan the uh, the appropriate, uh, how should we say, uh, entity to merge with? Probably not, because of it's, it's too big. Could they have gotten another uh, bank to merge with the, the failing bank? Probably, but that would have taken time. Time is uncertainty. And then I think it would be So there's a, there's a real difficulty there. Um, uh, you know, the, um, so that's, that's a real, real problem. Real problem there. I'm not sure what the answer is. Um, but I know that given JP Morgan, uh, more, uh, more of a market share was probably not the right answer. Hi, Professor. My name is Vinicius, and thanks for being here with us. In relation to the environment, sustainability, goals, and prices, and thinking about the division of powers between environmental authorities and competition authorities. Do we see any conflict or risk in, in trusting competition authority to deal with environmental issues and competition cases? Um, do I see a risk? Yeah, I see a risk, uh, rule of law risk. Okay, I, 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 I like to, to think that competition authorities should look at the economic crises, uh, so the economic uh, aspects. I think what competition authorities are good at is look at it is just, to put it somewhat crudely cutting through the bullshit and to you know because you see a lot of greenwashing and you know look at the original uh it's related to sustainability in the environment the Dutch chicken case uh, there's a lot of um of um green uh, sustainability and welfare washing of that case there and i think you know, competition authorities can point out these are the costs. Okay. Uh, environmental uh, authorities, I think they take, as well as so, take other criteria into account. Now you have so, but I, I don't. But I think they're the wrong criteria for competition authorities to take into account. And perhaps competition considerations are the wrong considerations for environmental to take into account. Now, ultimately, then you've got. A report, and in, in many respects, at least in a democracy, that's a political decision. Hopefully, you have, and I, I, I say that hopefully because I look at the talent that we have in the UK, and I certainly have the, the appropriate talent to make the right decision. But I, I think at some point, where there's a balancing, the balancing has to be outside of what the authorities, uh, with the authorities giving their inputs and, and, and putting the weight on the various scales. Professor Bruce, yes. good morning. My question was exactly on the issue of sustainability and the role of competition law. First of all, very good to be here. Thank you for, for hosting. Uh, this professor sent you. Um, you are saying very clearly that environmental sustainability are not a matter for competition law. Not necessarily. I noticed in the uh, power, in your PowerPoint that you were you were addressing the issue of environmental as being a public good, yeah. which of course is. Yes, yeah. Public goods are products that can only be produced by whether most of the people or whether all the people engage yeah. and cooperate. Yeah. So cooperation is pretty much on the basis of the production of public goods. So my question is, and then if you go to competition, competition is the opposite. We don't want we don't want companies to cooperate, no. oh, right? So you, you want companies to to drive to be driven to maximize their profits and to make the best in terms of innovation, in terms of technology, in terms of economy scale, so on. Um, so, uh, but you concede that this should be dealt from a legislative and regulatory manner. Should we consider whether the subject matter of the potential cooperation agreement between competitors is the production of public goods? And, and, and 
would that be an interesting approach or framework? And should this be made clear uh, when this is addressed? Okay, public goods. Public goods are interesting. We need them, right? Uh, Thanks for police, military, public health. We need public goods. Public goods are underproduced in the private market. Simply because you can have you can have internal as on the benefit side. That is free rider problems. Uh, um, ultimately, public production of public goods, uh, public goods are, will never well, be well produced in a uh, competitive environment. You will need some uh, limits to competition to produce these goods. And these limits can be uh, uh, via uh, entities that are tasked with the production of public goods and are likely funded through some some way of raising the you know, think of the armed forces that's public defense public health service is a public good I would say. Yeah, typically these are, are, are taxpayer financed environment we can environment there is a public good aspect to it there. There's also a problem with the market failure aspect to it there. We can, uh, uh, the market failure aspect is, of course, with externalities, uh, as the public issues is obvious. Uh, but also, there can be cooperative solutions in the public, in a, in, in a market driven by consumer demand. Uh, to, to reduce some of these externalities. Now, not all cooperation, not all collaboration is bad, period. Okay, that's, that is clear. Research and development, that is good within certain limits. Okay? Uh, the Europeans have a very uh, illuminating guideline about the limits to research. And, and you know, my example there are the COVID vaccinations. The vaccines. Again, collaborative research and developments. Standardization requires collabor collaboration, collaborative agreements. That is good. If you have an Android phone and somebody else has a, um, a, a Mac from an Apple phone, without an agreement on uh, standards for sending text messages or images, the, the two worlds couldn't talk. Okay, uh, that's just a, a you know there's without standards, uh, you, you get real hold, you know sort of hold up hold up problems with with consumers. I'm of the generation where we used to do. You, do you know what uh, um, video cassette recorders are? You know back in the old days before streaming, you had like okay. I'm of the generation where. We had VHS and Betamax, two competing standards. Okay, uh, beta, um, uh, VHS won that war. I'm also of, of the generation where, with uh, with CDs, we had the um, the Blu-rays and the. H I held off on mine, so uh, consumer hold up until that war was settled. Okay, because I wasn't going to invest a in a, a player, but more importantly, B. And a bunch of movies that would go would, would become archaic once that war settled. Okay, so but that's evidence of a lack of, uh, of standards there and, and how it harms. Had st standards been agreed earlier, the market would change, consumers would have the certainty. Standardization is good, research and development is good. Sometimes distribution agreements can be good to, to share uh, uh, almost um, to, to share networks. Okay. But then again, you, you need to worry about these sorts of agreements having anti-competitive consequences, blocking out new entrants, etc. So not all collaboration is bad. And there is a great, there is a great space in addressing environmental concerns for industry-wide collaboration. The real problem is the fine line between good collaboration and bad collaboration, with this fine line as it exists in the competition enforcer's mind and likely in the court's mind. You don't want to get anywhere near 
that line. You don't want to, as then as a lawyer, you don't want to advise your clients to get anywhere near that line because of the risk of antitrust fines. In Europe, they can be substantial. So the way of avoiding that, and this is uh, this is where I see, uh, as I was saying, the role of competition agencies is for any sort of market-driven solutions to re reducing some of these environmental concerns, is to give clear and precise guidance, whether that's in the form of guidelines or in very novel cases, actual compromises, saying we will not prosecute you. We will not get involved because we think this agreement pursues the goal and the society and consumers benefit. Thank you again, Professor. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Mackenzie uh, to host this uh, moment for us that we are getting together with Ibrac and also my university. Uh, it's great to have this opportunity and talk with you, Professor, about all the ideas that I think are uh, very important after the whole pandemic. Uh, we had I believe in 2020, uh, during the Ascola uh, meeting, uh, it was virtual, right? <laughs> but we, we had a whole session discussing um, prices and also uh, the effects uh, related uh, to the prices uh, in Brazil, Latin America, but also uh, during uh, the whole discussion, uh, the problem was uh, about price cooking and the control of prices uh, that you know some countries uh, were doing during that time. And the good thing uh, about sharing these ideas was to, to realize that the authorities, uh, generally the competition authorities, they are very concerned about it. Um, of course, we have the free market, and here in Brazil, I think we did a good job during the pandemic, uh, considering uh, the constitution principle that uh, makes not only competition, but free market as uh, a base of our uh, constitutional law. But uh, what I saw during that time is that uh, when we go a little bit further and we start to talk about these issues with uh, consumer specialists in Brazil, consumer law specialists, the view is not the same. Uh, so some some of the points here, I was making several notes. Uh, of course, we are talking about forms of market failures, failures too, and uh, I still believe that uh, we must focus on uh, economic concerns uh, when we are dealing with competition law. So I am following you, but uh, I think the the question that is uh, becoming this question is always coming is that. If it's necessary to change the rules that we have to deal with other issues, just like uh, here we are focusing uh, on uh, environmental issues. And also, uh, yesterday we were talking about digital markets. And of course, uh, we have different uh, market failures that we can identify now because the society changed. And also because during the pandemic, we were much more inside the digital markets and using much more uh, the tools that we have, uh, of course, uh, based on the fact that we were inside our homes, right? But uh, when we were just uh, taking the, the subject, subject about the environmental issues, assuming that, uh, we still have to, to have this uh, concern and focus on uh, matters uh, related to uh, economics and not thinking about, you know, the crisis moment. Uh, is it necessary to go a little bit further to open this discussion? I, uh, because I think that Europe, Europe is doing a good job, of course, uh, opening much more uh, the discussion to new issues. Here in Brazil, I think we were much more conservative uh, and trying not to uh, change the rules and not to change the way Kanti, or for example, uh, was dealing with those issues. What I can see now is that the world is changing, right? And maybe uh, we are not using the good tools that we have 
to touch to all the, the, the good examples that were uh, given by your book here and your presentation, uh, just like greenwashing. It's just a matter of consumer or environmental, or uh, we really need to think about it when we were dealing with a case at Cati, right? So these issues are very difficult for us in Brazil now. Uh, I would like to share uh, this because I still think that uh, this kind of conference is very important to share what competition law uh, is and what uh, the authority do and that everything that we talk about related to competition is related to our lives, right? But uh, still during uh, the conference that uh, I, I am following and yesterday I was at Panama State uh, Many people, people, they don't know nothing about competition. They know about the other instruments, and uh, this kind of discussion is far away from them. Even uh, when you are talking inside, you know, important universities in Brazil, and I think that in Europe, uh, you are in the second phase. Uh, it's much more uh, comfortable to talk about new issues that can be uh, and be analyzed inside uh, competition uh, cases. So, can you share with us uh, if uh, you think that now, after coronavirus uh, crisis, of course, we can face new, different uh, pandemics, and I don't like to think about it now, <laughs> but uh, the lessons that we can have, uh, and, and also the, the issues we must talk in a worldwide uh, you know, uh, perspective, uh, that you think that is still away from, you know, uh, these uh, visions because we have this difference between uh, the maturity, of course, uh, how how do you do uh, in Europe or, and, and how they do in the US uh, uh, deal with those issues. I think it's a more, much more comfortable than here in Brazil that we still have uh, with us uh, the controlling thing and also, uh, we don't think that those uh, aspects should be handled or touched by the, the antitrust authorities. Okay, thank you. Um, competition and competition rules affect all of us. We all live in the market. Um, everything we do, buy goods and services, we have markets. Even if you want to escape from markets, you have to go to some place like North Korea. Then they have black markets and uh, implicit markets, markets and implicit markets in their uh, Now, I'm of the old school and hence of the old, um, uh, I guess, the, the Brazilian approach where competition is competition and that's what competition is going to do. I think that the, there's, a, there's a number of market failures out there and there are a number of social problems out there. I think it's clear that even though we live in a market society, uh, competition law can't solve all social problems. Okay. Can competition law hinder these social problems? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I'm not going to say no because some people will come up with the numbers. Yeah. Okay. Um, but what I can say is in all of these crises, I don't think competition law hinder uh, solution to um, the competition laws, I was trying to say, is really good at spotting and addressing the market failures associated with the problem. Very good at dealing with identifying um, uh, market barriers. Uh, you know, we not listen to that woman from the hand gel industry, pharmacists who have been able to make hand gel in the United States. We sold it at a huge price. Um, well, what is the role, but now we're seeing, and we see this in the U.S. with the FTC under the Khan, we see this in the U.K. where competition seems to, or its competition agencies seem to be addressing problems, let's say, in um, the digital industry, okay? The problems associated with the digital industry true um, have a competition elements. We get a whole bunch of data. What is uh, this data is acquiring over the years? Is there uh, an ability or, or need to share this data? 
is the you know uh, is it is the data an essential facility? Competition laws all over the world differ on essential facilities. There's really no such thing in the U.S. even though the term um, originated there in Europe. It's more limited than most people believe it to be. Um, now the problem is is that say the 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 the, 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 the whole idea is what is the problem? When we look at, uh, let's say, the, the, the digital industry, the, the big online marketplaces, um, Google or something, I understand we don't have an Amazon problem of the Amazon industry here, um, uh, other than the big retailer. Um, but we have that too in North America and in the EU. Um, what, what, what is the problem there? Okay, you, you, so we start seeing a competition problem of self preferencing And we think, oh, and that's where, for instance, an online platform like Google prefers its own clients or its own you know, Google shops to other um, retail establishments. Is that necessarily bad? Well, Maybe yes, maybe no. There are whole arguments about advantages of vertical integration, so on and so forth. So there are some competition issues there. There are also some data acquisitions and data uses there. It is the latter, the, the latter, the former. The competition issues in uh, related to the uh, vertical integration and elements of the like. Yes, that's something competition agencies are really looking at. To deal with the data uh, that involves developing a new set of skills, is that appropriate for competition agencies? To deal with answers, perhaps. In the UK, you can look, uh, we have a digital markets unit in the CMA, and it's just developed. They passed the law, but unfortunately, even though the law authorizing this branch was passed, you need resources. So without that, it's just really hand waving. Competition agencies can't do it. Um, are we likely to get the right responses? Well, what's the problem? We need to, I think that's the clear thing. Oh, we, we, we see oh, Google, Amazon, um, whatever. These are Facebook. These are big, big, therefore bad. So we make that inference. Is that really a problem? Um, uh, big, we, big is often, at least in the U.S., is the reward versus us. Um, uh, we, in fact, see in, in the whole arguments about self-preferencing. These arguments repeat uh, probably um, well, it's the same arguments made, and I don't think the new, the, the people making the new arguments look at the old arguments. And these old arguments were, were made in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, where we had big department stores coming in. Now, big department stores were bad. Big department stores, as we know, aren't necessarily bad. Okay, in fact, they improve consumers' lives. So we're seeing the same arguments now raised against Google as as were being that were raised in the, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s against larger department stores. We know that to so I, I think when, when, we, when we step outside of, uh, um, as, as competition policymakers, lawyers, and experts, when we step outside that analysis of the market failure due to uh, monopolies and into other areas, I think we have to be cautious. We can't assume immediately that this, that this is a competition problem, and more importantly, B, that a competition solution is the adequate solution. We need, uh, and the key thing is we may, we may not have the expertise. We need to find those with the expertise of the expertise to get a solution. Okay. And, and that's, that's, that's my, my two cents to use that. <laughs> so first of all, thank you so much. We thank you this event together for me to be here among professionals that I have truly uh, follow and uh, admire. So 
Um, I mean, I don't know if you, if you have the opportunity to discuss a little bit those wonderful uh, group that we presented. And uh, I, my research agenda is usually towards a sociological approach. And I, I believe you have a very strong sociological claim in your book, uh, in the sense that I think you pointed out very clearly now that competition uh, law cannot solve all the all crisis. And perhaps uh, the fact is that competition system only observes the problems through our competition analysis, right? Uh, so in this sense, uh, and don't think it's a popular question, but are more a comment, is the nature of the crisis something important when we start to discuss what are the mechanisms that the system can uh, present for us? So we are talking about environmental crisis, we are talking about financial crisis, we are talking about uh, health crisis, so different kind of crisis that in competition terms uh, is translated to different problems, right? So in this sense, in sociological terms, this is an increase of complexity of um, the operation of the agency towards uh, the solution. Uh, so this will be the first comment. Uh, I believe in, in your book, in some ways, you, you claim this argument, right? Uh, so it matters to understand what is the nature of crisis and we need to understand if it's possible or not to have a proper solution by the competition agency. And the second question is uh, towards the chicken of tomorrow case, you know, um, because you also said that uh, despite the fact that there's limitations towards the competition answer regarding the crisis, there's an important uh, perspective that the agency uh, put out very clear what are you know the guidance or what are the possibilities for uh, the market so uh, the second comment i would like to hear a little bit is uh, even though there's limitations towards what a uh, competition agency could uh, present as a solution there is a necessary uh, or a mandatory perspective that the agency put very clearly to the public that it's not his or the structure uh, responsibility in doing that and pointing out what is a competition problem in that crisis and what is not. Right? Uh, so uh, this would be my second comment. And finally, uh, just uh, a third comment. Uh, you mentioned the COVID case, uh, and this also is a very deep discussion here in Brazil. And you mentioned the, the situation that you were in the taxi and you heard. Uh, the announcement of the pharmaceutical company saying, you know, it's in some kind of ways a misleading news, or I would say <laughs> a fake news, we could probably say. So, would you agree that fake news or misleading news is a kind of market barrier that is very serious today? So, these three comments. Okay, uh, first comment. <laughs> um, crisis, com yeah, competition can't solve it. So, let's yeah. Um, the what when we're faced with these crises, I mean, what, these crises were you know they they all involve market shocks in the sense of increase in demand or decrease in demand, etc. Okay, but what was the cause of all of this? And that's where we should, when, we're, when we're looking at addressing a. Um, a, a, a crisis, whether it's a public health crisis, whether it's an uh, economic crisis occasioned by a public health crisis or occasioned by something else, we need to look at the cause. Okay, we need to figure out how we can er eradicate that cause, or if, for instance, the cause has been, um, uh, is, is, is the result of some historical antecedents such as oversubsidization. Industry, we know. Let's try not to repeat it again. Okay, but then we, we need to look at okay, how uh, how can we um, we mitigate the consequences that we caused? Now, in in my mind, uh, and this is I think the theme of today, the theme of the book is competition deals with market failure of the market. So, as competition lawyers, we have to ask ourselves. Would adding more monopoly be a solution? 
The answer, I think, is almost always no. I say almost always because there's probably many companies that involved in it. Okay? So we as competition lawyers cannot address every problem. Okay? And we need to disabuse ourselves of that. The real problem with people with an area of expertise is there's, there's a North American saying, to a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? Yeah, you, you use the hammer to pound it in, whether it's a screw, whether it's a nail, whether it's a hook, or whatever. Constant competence to a competition lawyer, and, and, and in a lot of cases, everything looks like a competition problem. It's not. We need to disabuse ourselves of that. Competition cannot solve the problems. Competition can work with other disciplines, with other legal and policy areas to show how anti-competitive solutions to the problems can, uh, can be developed or to show how a proposed solution is or isn't anti-competitive. Okay. So that's what we need. We, need. we have uh, some limited focus. We are not, we are not the savers. The second guidance issue. Guidance. Guidance is important. We really need to have guidance. Okay. That, I think, is the key lesson. Without guidance, we don't know how to act. We know that in some cases, cooperation can resolve. We know in most cases, cooperation is, is going to be bad, particularly if we look at the industries. Okay, you must be say cooperation because they want to profit. We want to say cooperation because we want a successful vaccine. Okay, competition agencies can, I think, make an official cooperation a lot easier by mitigating or eliminating the risk by saying, no, we will not, we, we accept this agreement, we will not get the if you adhere to this agreement. And that's where we need uh, where the focus ought to be. Uh, the focus of the or a focus ought to be, and the focus is the system and the kingdom and such. Fake news and market barriers. Fake news is a problem. It's not it, it, it acts as a market barrier. It can act as a false advertising. And a lot of competition authorities wear two hats: consumer protection hats as well as a market protection. Fake news definitely falls in the consumer protection act. You see, uh, in the UK, our Competition and Marketing Authority has issued guidances on greenwashing. In other words, false claims, i.e. fake news, about the environmental benefits of certain arrangements or certain products and the like, and that they're going to take this on as the consumer protections. I think that's the way to go. It's not necessarily a competition law problem. It doesn't deal with the, uh, the core elements of market failure. True fake news can be used, as we saw in the example of taxi, to erect market barriers, but so can advertising, false advertising, false claims be used. I think the way to attack it is to attack it with a consumer. We have well-developed, uh, at least in the UK, most a lot of regimes have very well developed consumer protection regulations regarding these sorts of claims, and that's what we need to be reflecting. It may be the case that um, uh, the incentives for fake news, uh, how should we say, outweigh the, uh, the fines and the disincentives. If that's the case, that's an argument for increasing the penalties, increasing the prosecutions, better resourcing. Uh, investigation of that behavior. We have uh, one last question on the floor, please. Uh, first of all, Professor, it's an honor having you here. So I have one question. Uh, professor, uh, uh, how microeconomics conditions can amplify market failures and yet so affect the balance of well being and the markets? Because sometimes we we see the shocks uh, occurring in the markets and the players trying to survive and this and trying to constantly uh, make it more competitive and stay alive, um, like you said uh, in previous uh, period, uh, 
in COVID and 2020. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, they, okay, these market shocks can have redistributive effects. If, if, if you are a pharma, a drug store, or department store with a large supply of tangible prior to COVID, you could use your prices out. Of course, okay. Um, the the other the other problem is we saw an increase in sudden shots. Um, you know, just businesses staying alive as well as the um, a temporary demand, a temporary drop in demand. Okay, we saw that in the restaurant industry, uh, as 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 a clear case, travel industry. Alive. This is ultimately a political choice. Okay, governments can do one of two things. Governments can say, well, that's the market, that's tough, and thereby condemn a lot of small business owners and their employees to bankruptcy and unemployment. Politically, that is a disaster. Okay. The other choice is to support the economy, to, to hand out means of bridging the gap between, because uh, we hope that the, um, uh, how should we say, the the, the demand drop is temporary. Okay. And again, that involves a redistributive effect, shifting around tax tax money to support uh, to support this. Politically, it's a much wiser choice. Uh, I was, I was often, I think, in most countries. Uh, but again, it, it has led to demand uh, people holding savings. And there's some winners there that, uh, quite honestly, made um, made profits that in more time would be viewed as more profit. Uh, how the, you know this is is this a competition problem? Not really. This is a political distribution uh, distributive problem of distributive justice. Is it uh, are competition lawyers experts in distributive justice? Probably not. Probably not. Who are the experts in distributive justice? Do we have any? Or are those really sort of in a democratic society? Uh, something that we have the population? So, you know, so these are issues I think that are appropriate for order to address, but again, I think extend outside of the competition. As you've noticed, I think a very narrow view about what competition law should be doing. Okay, I don't believe in expanding it because I'm a, in my toolbox I not only have a hammer, but I've got a screwdriver and pliers. So I, I, I see there's many tools to, to a solution. Many tools to provide a solution. Okay. We have another part of the conference, and then if you have time, we'll come back for other questions, okay? Uh, next part of this event is competition law classes. Okay? This is related, this is related with the research that was conducted by Ibrak Jr. Uh, going to the law schools to verify if they are teaching competition law. Professor Juliana mentioned a reality that she faces in a big state, Brazil, okay? And they don't know, when people there, they don't know competition law. But it's a problem that you can face here in Sao Paulo and in other parts of Brazil. And I'm proud that Mackenzie is one of the first law schools to have as mandatory competition law for all students. Uh, in a part of the book, Professor Bruce, you wrote, market societies can be viewed as possessing two different elements, a system by which wealth is created and another system by which wealth is redistributed. The former is created through the market and the later is through a tax and transfer regime. The social goal of competition law is to increase surplus and reduce that with loss. In other words, to allow the market to grow wealth via the elimination of market's failures associated with monopoly. Maybe 
if uh, we start to teach competition law, people will really understand the meaning of a free market, the benefits of the market, and the wealth that is generated in a market that works in free competition. So I would like to invite Rebecca Juvenal and Maria, Maria Paula Pereira from Brack Jr. to present the benchmarking of the uh, Brack Jr. conductors. Bom dia a todos. É, thank you, Professor Bruce. É, gostaria de agradecer em nome do IBRAC Júnior e do IBRAC a oportunidade de, nesse último dia de encerramento da Semana da Concorrência, abordarmos uma pesquisa que foi feita com alunos de todo o Brasil para falar a impressão e o interesse deles sobre o direito da concorrência. Inclusive, abordando como os professores poderiam contribuir para a implementação nesse curso que é tão importante para todos nós dentro das universidades. A iniciativa do benchmark foi realmente propor com o objetivo de entender como os alunos viam o direito da concorrência, se existia o direito da concorrência dentro da sala de aula e como os professores poderiam implementar e entender o direito da concorrência aproximando ao aluno. Para isso, nós utilizamos é, duas frentes, uma com os alunos e uma com os professores, e a metodologia utilizada foi um formulário anônimo, via Google, compartilhado em espaços de interesses dos alunos, como grupos de sala, Facebook, e com os professores nós realizamos entrevistas que foram tanto presenciais quanto alguns preferiram responder via formulário também. Na etapa 1 um dos três, nós traçamos um perfil de como aqueles participantes da pesquisa entendiam o direito da concorrência. Já com os resultados aferidos, nós conseguimos traçar esse perfil, entender as demandas dos estudantes e conseguir alguns feedbacks para que o direito da concorrência estivesse mais próximo tanto da academia, quanto do mercado de trabalho, quanto dos próprios alunos. Passando, passando a etapa com os professores, nós fizemos novamente um perfil dos professores de lecionamento e de como eles estão aplicando as disciplinas que eles atualmente lecionam. E, a partir dessas experiências, nós produzimos algumas reflexões é, sobre os desafios para a realização da incorporação de uma matéria de direito policial nas grades curriculares. Bom... A primeira etapa dos alunos foi exatamente a questão do perfil. É, no formulário dos estudantes, nós recebemos 116 respostas de estudantes de todo o país e cerca de 91,4% eram estudantes que estavam atualmente na graduação. Desses estudantes, um número relevante que me chamou a atenção foi que a maioria dos respondentes estava no quinto semestre ou seja, exatamente no meio da graduação. É, através das respostas, nós conseguimos traçar também um perfil nacional. É, mesmo que a maioria das contribuições é, tenha sido feita em São Paulo, principalmente na região sudeste, nós percebemos que é, muitos estudantes fora desse eixo Brasília-São Paulo, que habitualmente está relacionado ao direito da concorrência, tiveram interesse de responder à pesquisa. Em segundo lugar, na nossa pesquisa, ficou a região Nordeste, muito em relação a novas a iniciativas como o IA, que traz esse empoderamento feminino para fora do eixo, e também o AND, que é uma associação que está sendo criada atualmente, que fala do Norte e Nordeste, e direito econômico. Aqui nós traçamos é, as principais universidades que responderam à pesquisa, 
por região. No norte, nós tivemos a influência da Federal do Pará. No nordeste, nós tivemos a Faculdade Baiana de Direito e Gestão. E no centro-oeste, tivemos o IDP. No sudeste, tivemos o UNICESP, que também foi interessante, porque é um curso muito novo de Direito, se comparado às outras universidades que responderam a pesquisa. E no sul, tivemos a Unicinos, que também foi uma surpresa, é, tendo em vista onde a gente consideraria que o direito da concorrência estava chegando. Então, foi muito importante os nossos resultados seguintes. Aqui, 67,2% dos participantes indicaram que nas instituições de ensino não ofereciam nenhuma disciplina que abordava o direito da concorrência, nem diretamente, nem indiretamente. E agora, a partir desse perfil traçado dos estudantes que responderam a nossa pesquisa, nós passamos as perguntas mais diretas aos estudantes que não têm uma disciplina de concorrencial na sua grade, que foi a maioria, e pegamos alguns feedbacks dos alunos que já têm uma matéria e, ou, enfim, já cursaram. Então, é, primeiramente, para a aferição de interesse, nós queríamos identificar o quão os estudantes da, da nossa pesquisa tiveram contato prévio com o tema. É muito interessante que a professora Liliana até mencionou isso, mesmo em universidades do eixo, uma quantidade considerável dos alunos, mais da metade, nunca tiveram contato prévio com o tema. Dos participantes que responderam que tiveram algum contato, a maior é, incidência de meios de contato foi justamente a pesquisa acadêmica, individualmente feita, por meio de webinars, do CAD, do BRAC e pela experiência profissional, ou seja, pelo estágio ou pelo PINCAD, que justamente traz uma oportunidade para diversos estudantes, também estudantes fora do eixo, de passarem no tempo do CAD e é, conhecerem o dia a dia da autarquia na prática. No total de participantes, uh, 78,1% responderam que acham relevante ou extremamente relevante o ensino de direito à concorrência nas, uni nas universidades, considerando aqui aqueles que já têm e aqueles que não têm. E é, 94,1%, que é um número muito expressivo, indica que tem interesse é, da inclusão de uma disciplina, seja letiva, seja obrigatória, na sua grade curricular da matéria. E aqui, passando ao feedback, os estudantes que já possuem uma disciplina em sua grade, é, 56,5% responderam que essa disciplina é uma obrigatória e 39,5% trouxeram que ela é oferecida no quinto semestre, ou seja, ali no meio da graduação. 65% dos respondentes indicaram que estão satisfeitos ou muito satisfeitos com a disciplina oferecida. Mas justamente pensando em melhorias das disciplinas que nós já temos atualmente, pedimos é, algumas sugestões ah, para os estudantes que tinham interesse, então nós tivemos até 14 respostas, mas foi muito interessante notar que com essas 14 respostas conseguimos identificar três temas principais. Primeiramente, é, uma constante foi a solicitação de que essa matéria de direito à concorrência fosse independente. Como essas respostas eram mais qualitativas, aqui eu até posso fazer alguns comentários, muitos estudantes mencionaram que, olha, é uma matéria que está junto de direito econômico, ou eu tenho alguma palhinha em outra disciplina não tão relacionada, e eu queria ter uma matéria independente, uma matéria focada em direito da concorrência. Outro ponto que foi trazido é a adoção de um modelo híbrido aliando aulas práticas e aulas teóricas, ou seja, aulas que tragam um pouco mais do dia a dia, ah, o que a gente vê de casos novos, etc. E esse foi um ponto interessante, porque ele foi trazido tanto como um aspecto de quero sugerir essa melhoria, como um aspecto de, nossa, as minhas aulas são assim e eu acho incrível e gostaria de ressaltar isso. E o último ponto foi, isso foi das, 13, das 14 respostas, 13 respostas que mencionavam isso, que é oferecer a disciplina no meio do curso. Porque alguns estudantes citaram que, olha, a disciplina focada em direito concorrencial é dada no final da grade, no oitavo, no nono, décimo semestre. Semestres que os estudantes naturalmente estão mais focados no CC, é, trabalho, OAB, e muitas vezes eles não conseguem se dedicar a explorar caminhos novos como direito concorrencial. <risos> 
Partindo para a etapa 2, sobre os professores, nós também traçamos um perfil e também analisamos como as disciplinas estão sendo aplicadas atualmente. No perfil dos professores, nós percebemos que, no mínimo, 10 anos a 20 anos de experiência é classificada dentro desse grupo de professores que responderam à entrevista, o que mostrou um vasto conhecimento, tanto histórico quanto prático, da disciplina de Direito da Concorrência. Também notamos que os professores, ao responderem, disseram que a disciplina era oferecida ou anualmente, uma vez ao ano, ou a um ciclo de dois anos, o que chamou também a nossa atenção, se caberia é, que essa disciplina fosse selecionada mais vezes, ou para mais estudantes. Porque, às vezes, como é, como é eletiva, essa disciplina é levada em um ciclo de dois anos, e às vezes o estudante não tem a oportunidade de cursá-lo. É, na resposta dos professores, de sete, seis responderam que, no mínimo, três professores qualificados poderiam dar essa disciplina é, na sua universidade, o que demonstra a capacidade da universidade em absorver essa matéria e implementá-la, seja obrigatória ou eletiva. Só que um red flag que também ap é, apareceu nessa pergunta foi a questão de nomes de professores que poderiam é, realizar essa disciplina. E ao mencionar os professores, percebemos que apenas 20% foram nomes de mulheres, o que demonstra realmente preocupante o um cenário no sentido de inclusão e diversidade do corpo acadêmico. E também gostaríamos até de mencionar que existem é, outras iniciativas, como o próprio BIA, que possui um grupo de mulheres realmente qualificado para trazer essa disciplina em sala de aula. Assim, a maioria dos entrevistados também esclareceu como temas do direito à concorrência está incluído na sua grade, mas de forma correlata, seja por meio do direito econômico ou matérias que envolvam é, esse tema, direito do consumidor, é, direito comercial, entre outros. E que há o oferecimento de eletivas para que o aluno se interesse e possa buscar o um aprofundamento da matéria. Com o passar das perguntas, nós fizemos perguntas mais específicas sobre como essa matéria era implementada nas universidades. E conseguimos fazer dois fluxos diferentes de é, implementação. O primeiro fluxo foi relacionado a uma parte mais clássica do início da implementação do direito da concorrência, é, nos anos 90, que foi é, uma retomada no sentido dos professores que eram ex-membros ou ainda eram membros conselheiros do CAD. Já o segundo fluxo mais atual era relacionado a um corpo docente que tinha um pensamento mais instrumental introdutório para entender o mercado da concorrência e é, voltar o aluno para o mercado de trabalho. Na mesma linha, não só na implementação, mas na continuidade da matéria, percebemos que um primeiro modelo seria mais tradicional, com um aspecto voltado ao histórico, o foco em, concur é, em concursos e a matéria ser disponibilizada nesse modelo até no dado corpo docente. Então, vai ser mais de uma iniciativa do próprio professor. Já o segundo modelo é um modelo que faz uma abordagem mercadológica, com a adoção de grupos de estudo, promoção de estudos, é, pesquisa e eventos para diferenciar do modelo já tradicional. Geralmente, é, nós percebemos que, nas respostas que é um modelo aplicado por universidades que tem um aspecto mais voltado à tecnologia e inovação. Alguns dados gerais das disciplinas, é, quando conversado com os professores em entrevista ou formulário, foi a sugestão de ideias que pudessem é, elaborar e implementar um melhor modelo para os alunos, para que esses tivessem mais interesse em cursar a disciplina. Ou aquelas, aquel, aquelas universidades que não tivessem essa disciplina pudessem implementar, como se fosse um meio do caminho. <risos> Aqui algumas características e sugestões dos docentes. É, nesse momento, quando os professores falavam sobre eletivas, 
eles nos, é, nos relataram que nos, é, quando havia o tipo, oferecimento dessa disciplina, geralmente eram de 20 a 30 vagas, só que elas raramente eram completas. Elas eram completas. E aqui surgiu um questionamento quando avaliamos os dados em relação aos alunos. Por que, que os alunos não procuravam essa eletiva? E nós chegamos à conclusão, por meio das entrevistas de ambos os grupos, que não havia um desinteresse, mas sim uma adequação à grade, é, uma falta de publicidade da disciplina e até mesmo a, a falta de conhecimento por parte do corpo discente. Sobre o oferecimento, é, nessa parte, tanto as disciplinas como eletivas e também obrigatórias, foi importante mencionar é, os alunos nesse ponto, porque os professores entendem que a matéria deveria ser aplicada no quarto e quinto anos, por conta da maturidade necessária para o estudo, o que vai é, em desanimo com os, o que os estudantes preferem, que é ter essa matéria no meio do curso. Isso porque, como a Maria já mencionou, é, o, quinto, o quarto e quinto ano existe uma preocupação com outras demandas, seja do mercado de trabalho, seja OB, até mesmo o concurso público para aqueles alunos que queiram seguir essa área. Então, é, esse desencontro talvez prejudique no momento de alinhamento da implementação da matéria. Aqui, é, nós buscamos entender quais matérias seriam importantes para se ter o direito da concorrência de forma basilar e qual seria a predileção de temas dos alunos com base no que os professores entendem ser importante. E na visão dos discentes também haveria essa separação novamente de um modelo mais clássico, tratar a parte histórica e econômica do direito da concorrência e a parte mais prática, que é sobre a aplicação da lei a casos concretos. A predileção dos alunos, a gente entende é, que é pertinente e realmente está alinhada com o mercado de trabalho, sendo a economia digital, controle de condutas e acordo de leniência, inclusive que são temas que abordamos durante essa semana da concorrência. As disciplinas basilares, como penal, civil, societário, economia administrativa e constitucional, são disciplinas que os professores citaram, que seriam é, interessantes para ter anteriormente ao direito da concorrência, mas não de modo obrigatório. Já para a difusão da concorrência, além da sala de aula, entendemos que seria interessante os professores abordar é, outros aspectos, para que os alunos se sentissem estimulados, além de estudar o direito da concorrência, também exercê-lo fora da, da sala de aula que os professores sugeriram eventos e a produção acadêmica. E com relação aos eventos, é, nós revisitamos o que os professores responderam e eles colocaram que existia uma dificuldade em relação aos eventos externos, que era a divulgação. No momento de divulgação, a maioria dos eventos externos era divulgado pelos professores e não havia esse, essa cultura institucional da própria faculdade, universidade, é, oferecer essa divulgação dos eventos e promover junto aos discentes. Já os eventos internos foram levantados três aspectos pelos professores. A ausência de recursos para convidar palestrantes fora do eixo. E aqui, além é, da falta de recursos, seria até o recurso de conhecimento de outras pessoas fora do eixo. É, a existência de outros eventos, Geralmente, os eventos de concorrência, na visão dos professores, têm alguma correlação de período, o que dificulta eventos isolados, e o baixo quórum dos alunos. E, novamente, é, trazemos o um questionamento acerca do porquê os alunos não estão participando desses eventos. Em relação à produção acadêmica, é, os professores falaram que existe esse incentivo à produção acadêmica, mas a maioria é um incentivo externo, seja pelo ICAD, pelo IA ou pelo próprio IBRAC. Mas dentro das instituições existe a Iniciação Científica e os TCCs, que também foram citados na, nas, nas nossas respostas. Já sobre as lacunas encontradas em relação a esse ponto de 
interesse do estudante versus disponibilidade do docente, é, os docentes entenderam que realmente existia essa lacuna da interface do direito da concorrência, ou seja, é, relacionar o direito da concorrência com outra matéria, seja o direito penal, o direito do consumidor, civil, entre outros. E com essa, implementação, essa possível implementação de interdisciplinaridade trazida pelo direito da concorrência, os alunos poderiam olhar o direito da concorrência com olhos é, mais positivos e entendendo que não era um bicho de sete cabeças. É, já em relação à lacuna da produção acadêmica, os professores trouxeram que existe realmente essa dificuldade, porque esse é uma disciplina específica e que os alunos entendem por diversas vezes inalcançáveis. Então, quando as pessoas entram em contato com o direito da concorrência, elas acreditam que elas não vão conseguir estudar aquela temática por conta da economia, por ser um mercado específico, ou a questão de ver na matéria um aspecto mais elitista. E os professores entenderam também que essa preocupação se daria também por conta da falta de interação. Então, por isso, é necessário incentivar também o aspecto de fora de aula, seja por grupos de estudos, é, por núcleos, entre outras atividades. A partir desse quadro geral que nós vamos ter de percepções dos professores e retomando novamente o feedback dos alunos, e aqui essa parte vai até ficar um pouquinho repetida, porque a... Rebeca já conseguiu adiantar alguns temas aqui, mas a gente vai ressaltar isso para justamente propor no final a, algumas sugestões para o enfrentamento desses desafios. Então, ressaltando aqui, primeiramente, gostaríamos de destacar quais são os benefícios da inclusão de uma disciplina de direito provincial. Então, primeiramente, muitos professores trouxeram a questão da exposição prática do raciocínio jurídico. Ou seja, além do conteúdo, trazer direito provincial é importante para que o aluno aprenda a aliar as diversas temáticas do direito para poder compreender a matéria. Então, isso forma é, o pensamento jurídico e permite que ele faça essas interconexões que vão ser tão necessárias na sua vida prática profissional. A própria interdisciplinaridade é interessante também, não só para que você consiga usar, mas para que você tenha outras ferramentas para a utilizar, como, por exemplo, as ferramentas econômicas. E outro ponto muito relevante trazido é a oportunidade de desenvolvimento individual do aluno. Por quê? Justamente pela dinamicidade da disciplina, é, ao lecionar, você consegue explorar no estudante outras características além do conteúdo é, técnico, como a, o estímulo ao trabalho em equipe, a cooperação, como fazer pesquisa de jurisprudência, é, analisar notícias da mídia, enfim, ferramentas que não são necessariamente ligadas ao conhecimento técnico, mas que são muito importantes na formação de um aluno. Alguns fatores atrativos, então, com base nesses benefícios, é justamente a dinamicidade, porque muitos estudantes trazem esse feedback positivo após terem uma experiência de aula de direito concorrencial. É interessante que muitos estudantes vêm até a matéria justamente por poder identificar na mídia os grandes casos emblemáticos é, e eles possam, com o ferramental aprendido nas aulas, tanto analisar esses casos como ir atrás de outros. É, e, novamente, a relação interdisciplinar, que é muito importante para o ensino jurídico do nosso país. Agora, pensando aqui, além dos benefícios, quais são os fatores desestimulantes? Primeiramente, a falta de oportunidades. Muitas vezes, a própria existência ou não de uma disciplina na universidade é um... E mesmo com oferecimento, como nós vimos as questões de baixo quórum, você tem traves como o encaixe de horário na grade, às vezes uma disciplina da tarde ou um período não tão favorável. Nós recebemos feedbacks de alunos também relativos aos créditos oferecidos pela matéria, ou seja, é, o quanto isso vai aqui para a pontuação final da sua grade, para que ele se forme. É, tem essa certa ideia também de que o tema é elitizado, que ele é extremamente sofisticado, muito nichado, que o aluno não vai conseguir, é, ou vai ter que fazer um esforço muito grande para conseguir acompanhar as aulas. 
pelo desconhecimento de alguns alunos sobre o tema, e como nós vimos, é uma porcentagem alta, muitos também não percebem a relevância social, porque identificam que esses temas, às vezes, estão muito longe, estão muito longe da sua realidade, e ele não consegue ver os efeitos práticos. É, o estudo de outras ferramentas, que pode ser atrativo para uns, também pode ser considerado algo negativo para outros, principalmente quando os alunos porventura entendem que essa necessidade de estudar outras ferramentas pode ser um impeditivo. Ah, e o outro ponto, muito trazido pelos professores, é essa aparente ideia de que o mercado de trabalho para o direito concorrencial é muito limitado. Então, o um aluno ali já buscando, pensando na sua carreira, seja pública, seja privada, não entende como se encaixar dentro do direito, de do direito concorrencial, mesmo tendo interesse na matéria, acaba não indo atrás porque entende que não vai ser um mercado que ele vai conseguir entrar. Então, com base nesses uh, aspectos, nós mapeamos, então, como os desafios. Primeiramente, a necessidade de sopesar grades curriculares que já são muito extensas, já que o direito tem um leque de temas, é, e, ao mesmo tempo, você oferecer ao aluno uma ampla oferta de possibilidades para que ele possa escolher ali é, livremente e personalizar a sua grade conforme os seus interesses pessoais. E a partir desse problema, você acaba tendo outros desafios decorrentes. Um primeiro é a variedade. Porque se você diz que ah, eu quero privilegiar um modelo que tenha eletivas e que o aluno personalize sua grade, é importante que você ofereça uh, disciplinas que abordam com maior profundidade a de concorrência, de preferência com uma regularidade maior, para que mais alunos consigam aí, encaixar na sua grade, bem como é interessante que você explore em outras disciplinas eletivas, talvez mais específicas, sei lá, como mercados digitais, que foi citado aqui hoje, é essas interfaces. Além disso, nós percebemos que a inexistência de outros métodos de difusão do tema em algumas universidades também é um desafio que abrange todos os problemas para a implementação. Por quê? Porque esses meios alternativos de difusão, como grupos de estudo, é essencial para garantir o interesse dos alunos nas disciplinas. Então, às vezes, é um primeiro contato até antes da sala de aula, uh, não só participando do grupo, mas olhando postagens, muitas vezes grupos são ativos na rede social, partindo do tipo, e isso vai fazendo com que os alunos conheçam o tema, é, mas também a, grupos de estudo, clínicas de direito comercial, elas permitem que após a matéria, beleza, fiz a letiva, eu consiga me aprofundar nesse tema sem ficar dependente de todo o tempo ali de ter uma aula e de ter professores alocados para isso. E, novamente, é, torna-se um desafio fazer uma aproximação com o mercado de trabalho, porque diante dessa problemática de que os alunos não têm conhecimento é de quais são as oportunidades que ele pode ter para ingressar na área, além do conteúdo, você tem que divulgar, você, você precisa é, apresentar as oportunidades existentes, seja no privado, seja no público, é, e também incentivar carreiras acadêmicas é, para fazer com que esses alunos é, não abandonem esse interesse simplesmente porque ah, não, me vejo, não vejo como trabalhar com isso. Então, devido à natureza desses desafios, fica, ficou claro para o nosso grupo que o enfrentamento dessas questões exige a atuação conjunta, não só das universidades, mas de organizações como o BRAC, que está tendo iniciativas como essa aqui, da Semana da Concorrência, do Escritório de Advocacia e até mesmo do próprio CAD. Então, nós gostaríamos de propor aqui, como nós vamos coordenar esses esforços desses entes de uma forma efetiva, para que nós podemos resolver esses problemas é, com cada um ali auxiliando no que melhor lhe cabe. E aqui nós trouxemos cinco sugestões iniciais. Bom, é sobre o oferecimento amplo de eletivas. Como nós falamos, poucas universidades oferecem o um curso de forma obrigatória e muitos dos professores também falaram sobre esse ponto, que não haveria um cabimento sobre oferecer essa matéria de modo obrigatório, tendo em vista o amplo número de matérias já existentes na grade. Mas, o oferecimento de eletiva seria uma solução para que todos os alunos tivessem contato com o direito da concorrência, independente do ano do curso. 
Outro ponto nisso também é justamente pela interdisciplinaridade que a gente é, combinou aqui na apresentação e falando sobre a variedade, essas eleitivas novamente não precisam só se restringir a direito concorrencial. Um feedback muito interessante que nós tivemos de, de alguns alunos é, foi de uma disciplina que eles falaram que estava sendo implementada na sua grade, ou seja, ainda eles não têm a matéria, mas que eles estavam super ansiosos porque eles entendiam que a discussão na sala ia ser muito proveitosa para algumas matérias que eles tiveram antes de economia. Então, dentro da grade de direito, ele tinha fundamentos de microeconomia, micro, macro, e nós entendemos que oferecer essas aletivas dentro da faculdade de direito também é interessante para promover um ferramental para que os alunos, quando forem analisar o direito da concorrência, não fiquem só na perspectiva jurídica e já tenham ali uma ideia das outras metodologias, das outras ciências que nós estamos para praticar o direito da concorrência. Bom, é, a segunda e a terceira iniciativa são relacionadas a fora da sala de aula. Então, o incentivo à criação de mais grupos de estudo que abordem diversos temas e a promoção de pesquisa acadêmica. Além disso, é, também foi sugerido que houvesse a criação de uma clínica jurídica da concorrência, é, entendendo que os alunos poderiam ali estudar esse caso, poderiam é, se aprofundar mais no tema e entender também que quando for realizado eventos, não só de direito da concorrência, de modo específico, mas também eventos de interdisciplinaridade, entendendo que o direito da concorrência, por ser um tema quase guarda-chuva, abarcaria diversos assuntos. É, ainda em eventos, além da promoção de eventos, que muitas vezes acaba sendo por esses grupos de estudo, uh, nós gostaríamos de incentivar uma cultura institucional de divulgar os eventos que tem. O IBRAC, o próprio CAD, sempre oferecem diversos webinars e oportunidades para que os alunos ali do YouTube consigam ter uh, os novos desenvolvimentos uh, da área, consigam ver discussões uh, tão importantes como o que está acontecendo aqui hoje. E, enfim, é, isso possa ser algo mais institucionalizado, porque alguns feedbacks dos professores trouxeram que isso acaba dependendo muito do quão ativo o professor é ou não nesses eventos, nessas questões, então é interessante trazer isso tanto pelos grupos de estudo quanto dentro da sala de aula. Outro ponto muito importante é a aproximação dos escritórios às organizações do MRAC e às universidades. É... Nós pensamos aqui, jogando por alto, vários métodos, várias uh, oportunidades que parcerias podem promover um, uma maior difusão dos temas de direito da concorrência. A Semana da Concorrência já está sendo uma. Outro exemplo que nós pensamos é, geralmente todas as universidades têm ali é, feira, feira de estágio, feira dos estudantes, algumas dessas feiras têm palestras e apresentações sobre a área, então sobre o escritório, no caso. Então, por que não aproveitar essas oportunidades em que o escritório, por exemplo, está se apresentando e você já emenda ali com uma aula magna sobre o tema? Qual é a prática do direito concorrencial advogando, por exemplo? É, muitas vezes, na sala de aula, você não faz a conexão de qual é o trabalho prático do advogado. Então, é interessante é, promover é, esses eventos complementares para que você consiga atingir diferentes pontos da graduação. Então, um aluno do primeiro semestre, no um calor, já consegue ele ter uma palhinha do que é direito da concorrência e guardar aquilo na mente. E quando chegar a hora, ele escolhe essa objetiva. Ou no segundo, terceiro ano, enfim. É, também a promoção de cursos uh, de verão. Eu acho que isso foi um dos feedbacks das instituições, de universidades que promovem cursos de verão com parceria com instituições, com parceria com escritórios para os alunos. Então, ali durante as férias, os alunos que têm mais interesse podem ali cursar. Uh, e ter mais conhecimentos além do da sala de aula, e isso já também se correlaciona diretamente com a inclusão da abordagem sobre o mercado de trabalho na grade. Acaba sendo muito importante já que esse déficit foi identificado, e aqui nós gostaríamos de ressaltar, é importante trazer essa abordagem não só no privado, não só na advocacia, mas também no direito público. É, seja pelo CAD, com oportunidade como tem CAD, ou trabalhar futuramente no CAD, mas existem outras carreiras públicas como especialista de políticas públicas, que o ferramental do direito da concorrência é muito interessante, muito importante para a sua prática na área, não só ali na hora do concurso. E muitos alunos não têm é, a percepção de como utilizar o direito da concorrência até mesmo nas suas carreiras públicas. É, isso é algo importante, porque não é tão difundido. Inclusive, ainda falando sobre o mercado de trabalho, nós pensamos aqui, 
É, isso é um desafio, muitas vezes, para quem está fora do eixo, já de que a maior parte dos escritórios está em São Paulo, trabalhar com CAD, você vai estar em Brasília. Mas a gente teve a experiência da pandemia aí que trouxe o teletrabalho, então isso é um ponto importante para as faculdades que estão fora do, do eixo, muitas que não têm matéria de direito concorrencial, e para que elas possam abordar isso com seus alunos. Você pode estar aqui, no Nordeste, no Norte, é, e ainda assim tentar pretear uma vaga de escritório, ou até o próprio CAD tem algumas vagas no regime de teletrabalho, e se inserir na área através do home office. É, essas foram algumas das sugestões que a gente trouxe aqui, mas seria muito importante, é, se vocês quisessem contribuir, discutir um pouco, ver o que acham é, dessas ideias iniciais. São apenas algumas proposições para que a gente possa pensar em como enfrentar esses desafios, mas não tem resposta fácil. Então, fiquem à vontade. É, pessoal, mais uma vez, eu gostaria de agradecer em nome do IBRAC Júnior e do IBRAC. É, esse benchmark ele vai estar disponibilizado posteriormente para vocês, mas como a Maria Paula falou, é uma coisa que a gente está construindo agora e nós queremos construir juntos. Então, todos são bem-vindos para a propositura de novas ideias, novas opções, em nome do direito da concorrência, para que a gente possa desenvolver a cada dia mais esse tema. E aqui está o nosso time, vou falar rapidamente o no nome de todos que ajudaram para que esse evento, essa semana, acontecesse. É, a Ana Binotto, Catarina Cordão, Ellen Delter, Henrique Santana, Isabela Panúcio, Jéssica Costa, Leonardo Giochini, Juiz, Juiz, Juiz Jarek, é, Marcela Carvalho, Maria Andrade, Nicolas Cosma, Rebeca Juvenal e Thales Neves. Muito obrigada a todos. Ellen, that is mentioned there, Rebecca, they are former students of McKinsey and nowadays they are working in the competition field. So I'm very happy with that. A suggestion and congratulating Ibrak Junior for their research, and then my suggestion, you should present this research to the Brazilian Bar Association because once uh, competition law became an issue to the bar exam, All the faculties of law will feel obliged to teach competition law to their students. Considering the time and that, uh, that I don't want to compete with lunchtime, that's a fair competition, <laughs> uh, I would like to, first of all, to thank all the audience for you that are here in presence, for those that are followers in YouTube. Uh, a special thanks to Professor Bruce. It was a truly honor to have you here today, Mackenzie. And I would like to invite Marco, Juliana, Professor Bruce for their final remarks. And then, Jenny Medrado, in the name of Brack, to the closing remarks of this amazing event, amazing morning that we had together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vicente, for organizing. I would like also to thank you for a fantastic event during the week. I think it's a, such a great initiative, Semana da Concorrencia. Congratulations on the team, the effort, and especially this presentation that's very important to understand what is the path that we have to you know, uh, promote in order to transform competition law in our country. I remember that during my undergraduation, I didn't have a competition uh, subject. I, I studied at UKI, and uh, it was in CAD, the program of an internship in CAD that changed my mind and opened me to the competition law reality. So uh, I think this kind of uh, discussion is very important. So congratulations for this kind of work. Once again, it was a pleasure to discuss uh, Bruce's book. It was such a uh, interesting perspectives about the future of competition laws and the challenges regarding how to respond to the crisis. And perhaps, you know, a law is always trying to make solutions for crisis. You know? So thanks God we have crisis also in order to have work. In the world. So this is also uh, something interesting to, to comment. And finally, again, uh, for me, it was a pleasure having here such Big professionals, and then Juliana, it's truly a honor. Thank you so much, Sanchez.
And I just want to thank you again for, for hosting me for, for this wonderful event. Uh, it's just a captain amazing week. Um, uh, I have very, I, I went on forever. It felt like this morning, so I have very few ways to, to add to that. But um, it's my, my only, it is some other thing up is that competition law is not the solution to every sort of crisis. Um, and we as a competition lawyers must recognize that. Uh, and, um, but it's also not the, uh, as well as not being the solution to every problem, it's not the cause of every problem. It does a block problems from being solved. Uh, um, what it does block is it, it blocks problems that are being solved in the end that harm, harm the public. And I think that's that's the good point. So thanks again. Uh, thanks for performing as another a wonderful a wonderful morning. And uh, I won't, uh, I'll shut up so that we can get to lunch, sir. Oh, <laughs> well, thank you again, you know, Professor Gross. I think it was amazing for us. Uh, not only hear the main ideas from your book, but also to understand a little bit more. Uh, the perspective uh, that is also something that we are handle and trying to face on Brazil after all the crisis and the new crisis that we have. <laughs> we always have we always have work, right? This is a good thing to say to the audience. Uh, so I would like to thank you, Ibrahim. Uh, uh, I will do it in your name, of course, but also in your names because I think this kind of research is so important. Uh, oh, because first we have this uh, photo, right? The picture related to uh, the perspective of the students. Second, because uh, it keeps uh, inside all the professors, you know, this fire to fight for more space for antitrust and competition. Uh, I had the opportunity in 2019 to uh, share with some professors, just like Bill Kovacic, uh, how antitrust was uh, uh, considered in our, uh, you know, grade, and also in Brazil, uh, how uh, we teach antitrust, and it was something really uh, impressive uh, to see uh, that we have so much space to fulfill. <laughs> And uh, I think this kind of um, event and the, the conference that we have, and also the work from uh, Ria. So I'd like to thank you for mentioning Ria so many times. Uh, this organization is still uh, uh, a great project of my life. Uh, I, I was to say that is my third child, because I have two, <laughs> two more. Uh, and I can see the movement. I can see the move. I can see it uh, after, for example, the WICAT. That is also an idea that started inside uh, WIA and then Kadi uh, also liked the idea. And now we can see the, 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 the law school's involvement, the professors, the students. And the groups, of course, are very important. Uh, four years ago, I changed it, uh, and I, I, I did it uh, with you know uh, lots of arguments uh, at the University of São Paulo from the Ribeirão Preto unit. Uh, we had now antitrust as uh, a regular, uh, a regular. Forgot the, the word. Yeah, regular class, yes, but uh, it's only in the end, right? It's in the fourth year, uh, so we need to have this base economics and understand a little about more about process and uh, constitutional law. I think it's it's impossible to think about teaching as I trust uh, after. Uh, before uh, constitutional law, for example. But uh, I think the ideas are very important to share uh, with the other professors. And I think you mentioned something very important, uh, involve the bar associations, and I think we can do it. Uh, it's important to do it. So thank you again. Thank you, Vicente, for organizing. Uh, thank you, Annie.
to, to share with us this work that you are doing. And thank you, you all that work uh, to show us uh, this perfect research uh, that, of course, we will, you know, split for, uh, we will do our job to share with our uh, friends, to other professors, to our uh, directors, to see what we can do to touch more uh, students uh, to take care and also to have inside the antitrust community. Thank you. Well, first of all, uh, uh, President Bruno Drago from Iraq, he is in Brazil, and then asked me to be here to, to close this full week of competition, Semana da Concorrência. Uh, there is a say saying that uh, Juliana, which is the Chief uh, Attorney General of Cali, besides being a professor, um, she mentioned her two kids. And we know that to raise a kid, you need a tribe. And I think for this week, it was possible to see that, that we took five, not only five um, law schools here in Sao Paulo, but also from different states. So on Monday, we had the Catholic school here in Sao Paulo, book and the Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais. Uh, also, we had on Tuesday, INSPER and Universidade de Brasília. On Wednesday, USP, a São Francisco, com o IDP e também a Universidade Federal do Paraná. Uh, Thursday, FGV São Paulo and FGV Rio de Janeiro. And today, Mackenzie, uh, USP Ribeirão, e também a Universidade de Dora, aqui representada, represented by Professor Bruce uh, Warhol. So it, it is, it, I think it's a great, uh, it's a great sign that competition law is being spread, is being disseminated. It is a great sign to see that we had 300 people online throughout throughout the uh, the the week and also 140 people attending this is exactly um, uh, these sessions. So uh, I think this, and, and I, I don't think I get much fans, of course, that the board of Ibrath will have to decide to do it or not, but I think it's not only the week of competition, but this should be the first week of competition. Certainly this should be repeated next year in your already request, also Professor Vicente the support of, of McKinsey. Um, uh, another note, very important to mention the work of Ibrac Junior. At some point we were we, we, we saw that this week would, would have would also give lots of work and Ibrac has many activities. Uh, so we said well why don't we bring the young energetic uh, and bright uh, young attorneys that we have within Ibrac to help us organize. And we see, and we, we could see what, what happened. So, thank you very much. Rebecca Jorena is here, present, Maria Paula Pereira, who are here, Catarina uh, uh, Cordel, Lou Cordel, also from the Brack Junior. So, um, uh, and all the names were mentioned already. So, I thank you uh, on behalf of, of uh, the leadership of the Brack for your work and for your dedication. Um, Without much, much to say, I think the, the, uh, we saw here a, actually it was a, an analysis of a relevant, bar, of the relevant market for competition law course, probably a two-side two market. So, um, fantastic analysis and we'll certainly, we should not put it on the drawer, we should certainly use it and spread the word for the bar for the for or for the OAB and other um, other uh, um, entities that may benefit from it. So with uh, with this, I think we can close. And yes, please, Professor Juliana always has created this, and she is inviting everybody 
to join us here for a picture and to close the record for YouTube. Okay, so please join us here for a great feature. O evento é encerrado. Obrigado a todos. Até a próxima semana. Don't be afraid. Join us. Bora, que Obrigado. Muito mais. Vamos aí.